you are live on youtube good evening dr ravi kumar good evening good evening sir good evening dr ahmed is also welcome dr ahmed good evening good evening in india good morning to dr ahmed and good very good evening like late evening i think for dr simya man uh, welcome uh, dr kiranjit singh is also Mohan, you will let us know when we have to start. Congratulations, Doctor Mohan. Yeah, good evening, Sri. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much. Mohan, Mohan. Madam, three minutes remaining, Madam. Yeah. So you will let us know when we have to start. Are we live on? Okay. Oh. Yes. The countdown is going on in YouTube. Dr. Ravi Kumar, I put your video. You can speak if you want at that time. So I have to give further comments. Okay, I'm even ready with my presentation. Yeah, if but I just, uh, also just. Thank Yes, please. Uh, are we live on Facebook, YouTube, and YouTube? YouTube is there. It's saying waiting for Shankar Nitra. Ah, uh, YouTube is started, madam. Yeah, YouTube is on. Yes, madam. 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 ना उनको मल्टीमीडिया डॉट इन लेन काम चलेंगे मैडम हम इधर में कन स्टार्ट में एवर इट्स नॉट प्लेइंग ऑन यूट्यूब
good evening everyone i welcome you all to this cataract update 18 on secondary iols uh, a very uh, interactive uh, webinar which is going to be from shankar netralia so we have entered a new year with a lot of hope and with these words of ts iliad we want to have a new voice for the next year have uh, a very hopeful and a happy new year to all of you and with this i introduce uh, dr shikha who is the backbone of this program she is the deputy director of neuro ophthalmology services in shankar netralia and a senior consultant doing very complex cataract surgeries apart from the patient care she is very much interested in organizing and conducting conferences whether it be of neuro ophthalmology or cataract cataract update is her baby and she is actually already successfully completed 17 till now and this is the 18th cataract update the past two cataract updates were also virtual and available on the link uh, um, in the website so thank you dr shikha for having me as a part of the program and all over to you to introduce our eminent uh, panelists and stellar speakers and start the show thank you dr shrivalli and a very good evening to everyone uh, welcome to the cataract update uh, 18 shrivali you can go back to the previous slide let me introduce everyone my co host for the evening dr shrivali kaza dr shrivali kaza is a senior consultant with cataract services at netralia and uh, she's also a trained cornea surgeon so let's begin uh, today's program with the introduction of the esteemed panel and it's my honor to introduce dr lingam gopal who's a very well known name in the field of ophthalmology indian ophthalmology and is right now contributing uh, in singapore as well in various capacities he is a senior consultant with nuh singapore associate professor nus senior investigator in seri he is still uh, working with us as a senior consultant at netralia but he has been the chairman of medical research foundation from 2007 to 2009 resident vision research foundation 2004 to 2006 and he's headed the department the retinal department at netralia for 8 years from 1990 to 1998 it's indeed a, a matter of great pride for us to have uh, sir with us in the cataract update welcome sir thank you uh, we we are also honored to have uh, uh, dr uh, girish rao i'm honored to introduce him he is the uh, president of medical research foundation netralia trained vitreoretinal surgeon and he is um, he is adept at many uh, techniques of secondary eye placements so welcome welcome to the update sir i am uh, delighted to uh, introduce uh, dr pramod bhende one of the most meticulous vitreoretinal surgeon in india and uh, what uh, others might not be knowing is that he is also excellent he is an excellent uh, phaco surgeon as well he is really good at complex cataract surgeries as well he is uh, the director of vr department at netralia and he has uh, published around 84 papers in peer reviewed journals and given many presentations across the world welcome to the update sir thank you very next much next week shikha next we have uh, uh, dr sumita agarkar uh, she is also a very well known name in the field of pediatric ophthalmology and she is the deputy director of Pedi pediatric ophthalmology in adult strabismus clinic at netralia and we welcome her Uh, welcome to the update dr agarkar so Thank with you, that sir. friends uh, uh, we are going to begin the uh, star stud studded sessions uh, of the cataract update 18 and uh, at this point let me tell you friends that we have got uh, two members of the editorial board of ophthalmology journal dr ik amar and dr sanjay patel already they've joined us for the update the talks are uh, they'll be introduced later on but they've already they are up that you know in the west it's uh, early hours and uh, they've joined us for the update and uh, uh, dr prema padmanabhan uh, who's a medical director with netralia and she has uh, 
guided the cataract department at Netralia from its inception. So uh, she is also uh, with us for the update. So I welcome all of you once again. And with that, let's start the first session of the uh, update. And for that, I invite Dr. Shin Yamane, whose novel technique of doing secondary IOLs uh, has been extremely well received across the world. And he is a PhD from Yokohama University. And he has done his retina and uh, his ophthalmology training from Yokohama University and is currently the director of Yamane Eye Clinic. So welcome, Dr. Yamane. And uh, over to you to tell us more about the sutureless uh, spheral fixation of IOL, the Yamane technique. Yes, thank you. So can I can I start my lecture? Please, please. Okay, can you can you see my slide? Yeah, the slides are visible, please, you can carry on. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you for inviting me. And today I like to talk about flanged IOL fixation technique, so-called Yamane technique. The concept of the Yamane technique is minimally invasive and sutures and firm haptic fixation. This surgery is a transconjunctival surgery with 30 gauge needles. So the wound is perfectly sealing without any suture or glue. And the flange of the haptic can fix the haptic strongly. So this is my surgical video. I first make PI before pupil dilation. And after vitrectomy, I made two square thumbnails with 30 gauge single needles. And after injection of, of the IOL, the so, uh, leading haptic was inserted into the first needle and the trailing haptic was inserted into the second needle. In this time, I just put the first needle on the eyelid. Then the haptics were externalized with the needles. And I usually cut, cut the haptic one or two millimeters. Then make flange. Finally, the flanges are pushed back and fixed into the square tunnel. This is the data of my surgery. And the reflective error from the predicted value was about minus 0 0.3 diopters. So the lens position is almost same as the in the back. The myopic shift from the in the back fixation is not so large in this technique. There are small numbers of complications. Vitreous hemorrhage, hypotonia, IOP elevation. But these are not so big problem and they are uh, spontaneously resolved within one, one week. The big problem of this surgery is the eyelid capture of IOL. We, we met 5.3% of these complications. This technique is very simple, but there are many tips and tricks so today I'd like to introduce you um, 
eight steps mastering method for beginners. The first step is bending needles. The 30 gauge cinema needle should be bent at about 45 degrees with bevel up. And I recommend you to make practice to insert the haptics into the needle on the table before your first case. The grasping point is very important. If it's too near from the tip, impossible to insert. And if it's too far, very difficult to control. So you should grasp the haptic about three millimeters from the tip. And you should sometimes rotate the needles in this situation, if the needle hole face to inward, you can't insert the haptic into the needle. So you should turn the needle to make the needle hole face to outward. You should find which, which way is best to insert the haptic into the needle in this practice. You should also change the direction of the haptic to make ease to insert the haptic into the needle. And you must make both hands, right and left hand, The next step is marking. The insertion point of the needle must, must be separated 180 degrees and the corner incision for IOR insertion sh should be separated about 70 degrees from the left square tunnel. If the main wound is separate it over 90 degrees from the left one, left square toenails. You can't align the needle and the haptic, so it's difficult to insert. If the positional relationship of the wounds are appropriate, you can easily align them. So you can easy, easily insert the haptic into the needle. I usually make one percentitis at 10 o'clock and the squirrel toenail is make one, two millimeters from the limbus with angled fashion. As, as you can see, the length of the squirrel toenail is, is about two millimeters. The IOL is inserted on the eyelids. And you should grasp three millimeters from the tip, then insert the leading haptic into the first needle. It's safe to put the needle in this situation because the tip of the needle is covered by the haptic. Then the lead trailing half tick is inserted into the second needle. So some doctors 
use single needle technique. They externalize the leading haptic first, then insert the trailing haptic into the needle. You can make, you can use this technique, but I, I don't recommend to use this technique because it has a potential risk of haptic deformation and the slippage of the leading haptic. Step six, haptic externalization. It's not so difficult, just, just put the, pull the needles. But if, if you pull out one side, it has a risk of three page of the another side. So you, you should pull both of the needles to keep the lens at the center. Making flange is not so difficult, just heat it with ophthalmic cautery. But <laughs> there are some tips in these steps. I usually use um, this uh, cautery, Acutemp ac cautery with, um, by Viva Visitex. You can use any type of coat leaf, but I, I don't recommend you to use uh, diatherme. It's it's difficult to control the control to heating the haptic. If the if OVD is attached to the haptic, you can't make flange be because you can't heat the haptic enough. So you you must wa wash the haptic and dry up be before making flange. And don't don't uh, touch the haptic with cautery; it it will adhere. And the shape and the size of the haptic is different in the different materials. And some material will disappear by heating. So you, you should try to make flange before your first case. I, I recommend you to use uh, IOLs with PVDF haptics, but the most most country in most countries you can't get PVDF haptics IOL. So in in these countries, I recommend you to use a sensor or technique for French technique. The French must must be um, fixed in the corner. Uh, squirrel thumbnails, if it's not enough, it can move after surgery. If the flange is too, too large to insert into the squirrel thumbnails, you should enlarge the entry side of the squirrel thumbnail. Then the flange can completely fix into the squirrel thumbnail. Again, the flange should be fixed completely inside the square. For, uh, for control of IO tilt, the insertion angle of the needles is very important. But it's not so easy to control the angle by manual.
in in these in these figures, the the, the angle of the ins insertion is not so different, but in the side view, the the insertion angle is very different. It's not so easy to recognize the vertical angle of the need needle by using a surgical microscope. So I developed a special instrument named needle stabilizer to make the insertion angle of the needle constant. This instrument has a link-shaped body with two wings. And the wings has a groove. And the body has a claw to, to fix the eyeball. The needle that should, should be fit to the cornea, then the needles are inserted through the groove of the instrument. And uh, IO tilt is caused by haptic compression so we we, sh we should make tension with the haptics to avoid IO tilt in this situation I just pull out the haptics and I found the tilt of the, hap the IOL is significantly improved. That is why I, I trim the haptic before making flange. This process can reduce the IO tilt of the IOL. So this is the take home messages and the Amane technique looks very simple, but not so easy. Please try eight steps method to master this technique. And for good surgical outcomes, special instrument and techniques are very effective. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yamane. That was a really enlightening talk with a very, very clear steps and very good videos. So we will take all the questions after we have the other uh, presentation of the uh, session. Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran. Uh, he is a faculty at Arvindai Hospital and uh, he is one of the young innovators. Uh, on his LinkedIn page, he has a lot of uh, presentations, publications, as well as a lot of projects with a uh, lot of innovative techniques, and one of which he is going to be uh, sharing with us. Uh, we welcome Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran. Dr. Prabhu, over to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th thank you, madam. Thank you for uh, involving me in this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, let me share my video. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just sharing my video. 
This is about the Xnet device, uh, which is our uh, recent innovation in collaboration with uh, Oral App. We have designed this uh, device, you know, exclusively for uh, doing SFL surgeries. So the device comes like this. Uh, you know, it has got a customized uh, 26 gauge needle, which is pre-bent and uh, pre-loaded with uh, silicon stopper, as you can see in this, uh, you know, picture. And the needle is attached to the handle. Uh, again, you can see uh, the handle is ergonomically designed with uh, fine uh, finger grip. And to the back end, it has got uh, sclerotomy markers at 1.5 and uh, 4 mm. The 1.5 marker is pretty good for, you know, it acts as a guide where you where exactly you need to make the sclerotomy and enter uh, for your SFL surgeries. So with this small introduction, let's go to the surgical video. Yeah. So now you're going to see the videos. Yeah. So this is a surgical video. It's a case of uh, a dislocated nucleus wherein I have done the lensectomy and we are moving on to the X-net part. So 180 degree apart on either sides, we do the scleral grooves. I prefer a side port knife, so I get a broader entry for easy tucking. So the green thing, what you can see here is the x device with the sharp needle I'm going inside at 1.5 mm away from the sclera. Once you the tip of the needle is inside, you change the direction and come out through the uh, sclerocorneal section that you have made. So it's a good tip to use the McPherson and then come out so that you avoid injury. Once you see the tip inside the uh, three-piece, uh, you know, apic of the three-piece eye oil, three mm of docking should be good. So you do all of this extraocularly and you don't do anything intraocularly. Once docked, you retract the needle. At the same time, push the eye oil. It has to go as a one unit. So you don't retract separately and push the needle separately. It has to go as a single unit. Well, now you're ready for exteriorizing the leading aptic. Push the double protection silicone stopper, keep the foramen, uh, keep the McPherson there, and then uh, you know just hold the yeah hold the haptic and move the silicone stopper a little bit and uh, push it close to the sclera. This is to get additional length so that your um, you know maneuvering of your trailing haptic is simpler. You do the same step on the other side. Now you can see the needle tip inside. Now change the direction, come out of the section again. Use a McPherson forceps. I'm going to see now. Yeah, you keep the McPherson forceps come out like a sweeping motion. Uh, don't try to penetrate the tissue. It's very important that you don't entangle any tissue over there during the step. Again, once you lateralize, you, you know, now you can see the tip of the needle outside. Again, uh, now the trailing aptic, you just have to retract with the McPherson forceps. I, uh, I, I try to flip the McPherson forceps and retract and push it inside. Again, you do it extraocularly, so you don't have to worry. Uh, for any intraocular maneuver at this stage. There's a little bit of learning though, but you can definitely get it. Once it's done, again, 3mm of docking is adequate. Once you're comfortable docking, you retract the needle. Yeah. So again, uh, now you're going to exteriorize the trailing aptic. Take a McPherson, go to the uh, you know sclerotomy point and wait for the aptic to be seen. Once you see the aptic, just engage that, just hold it and disengage the needle. This is to avoid any undue pressure on the other side. So now you can see both the aptics are exteriorized and it's uh, you know in, intact. Now you can comfortably push it inside the scleral groove that you have made. Extent is basically you know all about exteriorizing the aptic. It just simplifies the way the aptics are exteriorized without any intraocular maneuver. Once exteriorized, you can always combine it with any fixation technique. It can be combined with, you know, what I'm doing is a modified technique of Gebauer Sharia, but you can use a scleral flap and use glue to fix it, or you can use Yamane's planche and do it. All of that you can do, but x simplifies the way you exteriorize the aptic and simplifies the SFIL procedure in general. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you, Prabhu. Ma that was that was an excellent video. Actually, um, before we go to the panel discussion, uh, a little bit uh, about uh, this technique of yours. Uh, the history of uh, these uh, sutureless uh, sterile fixated IOAs. There, I was doing a literature search, and Dr. Dipinder Singh has described something similar with a 26 gauge needle that you make a tunnel with a needle and you go inside. And I think it's uh, it's it's kind of a concept by something similar to it. That's what I found. Wonderful, wonderful video. So let's begin with the audience questions here. So uh, uh, if we go through the questions, most of the questions are uh, around the specifics of the instruments and usables. 
like sutures, intraocular lenses. Dr. Sunil uh, wants to know uh, that uh, what are the instruments, uh, IOLs, and Dr. Abe Kurana wants to know about the kind of pottery that is used. And uh, a doctor from uh, uh, Malaysia wanted to uh, know uh, if the micro forceps are not available, uh, what, what should be used if those forceps are not, uh, not available. So uh, my question to the uh, panel is that uh, Dr. Imani has already shown and uh, Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran has already shown his, uh, their techniques of uh, doing the sutureless lateral fixation. So the panel has any variation uh, with regards to the instruments or uh, the uh, other uh, things, IOL, uh, that it, they use for doing the sutureless lateral fixation. We'll begin with LG, sir. Yeah, I think the modification that I do is, I do almost like what Dr. Yamane has described, except that I don't bend the needle at all. I keep it straight. My argument for not bending it is that if the, if the needle turns in its axis and it's a bent needle, the needle can face in any direction. And if we are not aware of in which direction it is facing by looking at the hub of the needle. While if it's straight, we know exactly where the needle tip is. So I don't bend the needle, but I didn't face any problem by not bending it. The second change I make is I make a scleral tunnel for introducing the eyewell rather than a corneal incision that doesn't distort the cornea and allows us to see the needle tip much more comfortably. And the third change I make is that the first haptic introduction is done directly with the injector itself. That is, you don't inject the eye oil fully inside, keep the eye oil inside. And then once the haptic is engaged into the needle, then your assistant will inject the eye oil fully, but the trailing haptic is still outside. And this tra trailing haptic is introduced to the, into the needle by using a 25 gauge intraocular instrument. That is not external instruments, but vitreous forceps is easy to introduce because once it is introduced inside the eye, there's no leakage of the wound and you'll be able to see the haptic, the, the needle clearly to introduce the haptic. And, and since unfortunately we don't have the, the kind of uh, eye oils which Dr. Yamane is using, we use the AR-40 lens, but the, the tip can be cauterized quite well and the flange does form quite well. This is the modification I'm doing. Which cautery uh, do you use, sir? Same, the same heat cautery what he has shown. That is where the yes. tip has to glow red hot. That is the kind of cautery you need to use, not the one which we use to cauterize the conjunctival vessels during cataract surgery. That kind of a cautery doesn't work. You need to have something which actually glows hot at the tip. Yeah, something we use for a scleral buckling actually just to marking that one. It's the same cautery what you use. Exactly. A regular like a bipolar will not work out. We need to have something hitting up so to melt the yeah. tip. The, the other thing I would like to stress is that the uh, thin walled 30 gauge needles probably are not available in India. You may have to get it from a specific source, uh, but I would strongly recommend not to do and get away with the using 27 gauge needles. We can do with 27 gauge needles, but those tracks tend to leak and they're not as good as a 30 gauge needle. And the advantage also of a 30 gauge needle, thin walled needle is that once the haptic goes inside that it does not disengage easily. It stays within it. It's so easy to, to orient the eye oil without any problem. It's available, so Dr. Dan's question. Yeah. Dr. Dan's question about... Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. Dr. Tan's question about if the micro faucets are not available, then LG sir has given the solution directly engaging it uh, inject with the injector. Directly the uh, haptic is introduced in the needle. No, that no, is that is the first, that first can... haptic. First haptic is engaged directly in the needle with the injector in place. While second, the trailing haptic is introduced using a vitreous forceps. We use the intravitreal forceps, which is a 25 gauge serrated jaws forceps. That works beautifully. So uh, that is a replacement. That's his answer. That's a replacement if you don't have uh, those micro forceps. Uh, uh, Dr. Girish Rao, uh, your comments on the technique, your modifications. Yeah, I, I think I follow most of the uh, steps which Dr. Prabhu has uh, mentioned. Uh, Dr. Yamani's technique is beautiful to look at, but it's a little complex when you actually try to manipulate the lenses within that small uh, anterior chamber, especially the real difficulties with the trailing haptic. So obviously, uh, the technique that where he has suggested, maybe we can all now try and follow that to see if we can still 
engage the uh, leading haptic while we are manipulating the trailing haptic. But I'm, as I said, more comfortable with the technique which Dr. Prabhu has uh, mentioned, where you exteriorize the uh, needle and uh, manipulate the lens, uh, the, the haptic inside. I do not use the stopper like what he does. I introduce the leading haptic directly into the tunnel. Now, because the tunnel is a straight tunnel, the uh, friction of the haptic with the tunnel engages it in place. If the tunnel is wider, that's when, when you are manipulating the trailing haptic, the leading haptic could disengage and come out. But if the tunnel is made with a 25 gauge uh, NVR, it's just about enough to engage a haptic and it stays in place even when we are manipulating the trailing haptic. That's the only modification from the technique which Dr. Prabhu has. My point of uh, little discomfort with the Yamane technique is I feel that the intra-scleral length of the haptic is less. So it almost acts like a two-point fixation of an IOL as compared to the technique which Dr. Prabhu and I use where the haptic length is a little more. So it's almost like a four-point or a much wider fixation. But Dr. Yamane has shown beautiful videos to show that the uh, IOL tail is not there. So that's again something which I had a uh, little bit of concern that there could be a pseudo-fugue analysis with this apparent two-point fixation because of the relative short interest radial extent of the haptic. Uh, can, can I make a point here? Yes. Uh, the, the issue, that is that uh, the to make sure that the interest uh, channel is long enough, you must make, I usually make three measurements. One is on the limbus, 180 degrees apart. And two millimeters from the limbus, even if you don't have the stabilizer, which Yamane has shown, you make one more point to, to two millimeters and two millimeters across, that is parallel to the limbus, you make a third point. So okay. when you introduce the needle, it actually goes intrastrally right up to the second point. So once you make a two millimeter intrastrally track and then turn inside the eye, the chances okay. of the eye world tilt is almost eliminated and is exactly parallel to the limbus. Okay, sir. TV, sir? Uh, no, I don't have a personal experience with uh, like a, both Yamanes or uh, glue IOL. I, I prefer most of the time is a suture fixation. So not much to add here, but I agree with what Dr. LG said. Probably uh, the parallel to limbus or maybe parallel, your needle entry should be parallel to iris plane. Rather, let me put it there to make a uh, more clear that way. And uh, entry of the needle, if any technique of the SF IOL, uh, somehow I'm uncomfortable going 1.5 to 2 millimeter because then you are on a pass plana. The elegant studies have shown, you have a cadaveric study that when you have a from surgical fear, limbus, your ciliary circus is in a vertical meridian at 12 and 6 o'clock is somewhere average 0.84 millimeter and it's a horizontal meridian, it is somewhere between 0.46 millimeter. So I prefer entry at 0.5, not one or two, because see, the moment you come somewhere near one, you are hitting major arterial circle, uh, iris circle there. So risk of bleeding hemorrhage is more there. And 1.52 means you are already on a pass plana. Again, see what a ciliary circles, the stability you get is a ciliary circles. Is, and we are on a pass plana down. I think that stability is, stability is lost. Risk of guilt is much higher there. And yes, uh, except uh, I would say Marfan, that group where iris uh, sometimes is a to iris a tone is not that good enough and chances of pupillary capture is much higher. But otherwise, uh, there's hardly issue of having iris capture, uh, pupillary capture rather, I would say. Uh, when I use even somewhere, I generally go somewhere between 0.5 and 0 0.75. That's my entry point fixation. Dr. Sumita, would you like to make any comments regarding the... I would like to ask a question. Sure, sure. Can this be done in children safely? Uh, maybe the question is for Dr. Yamane. Has he had, does he have any experience with children? And uh, number two, can can the same technique be used for fixating in the sulcus rather than in the say? Uh, this I, I, don't, I don't. I don't have a experience in child. Uh, my youngest one is thirteen years old. But some, some, my, some of my friends has an experience of the children and three years or four years, and they, they said it's safe for children. 
can i add yes uh, yeah so basically youngest age what i did is around 4 years the logic is somewhere by 4 years 96% of grow and segment growth is complete that's what i take it power i all power calculation will be issue here but given option i would prefer to avoid till at least 7 years of age that is as far as i take cut off point except in a situation where you have unilateral apic and you have a difficulty in uh, rehabilitation then those uh, exceptional situations youngest i did as a four dr ahmed dr i kemal would you like to add anything so i think uh they've been covered very well i i, I would just add i think landmarks are very important and i think the comments that have been made to try to go a little bit more posterior i i tend to try to fixate uh if i'm using the limbus as a landmark at least 2.5 mm back from the limbus uh if we go to anterior then the concerns are iris chafing or pupil capture or hitting the major circle as we've heard so i think that's important um i like to mark the needle the 30 gauge needle tsk needle uh you know a 2 mm uh mark on the needle So it tells the surgeon as you're entering the sclera where the two millimeter mark is to know when to be sure you're into the eye, because as we heard from Dr. Yamani, the needle length in the sclera, the tunnel is important to prevent tilt or decentration. So that's the that's the technique I think that might be helpful is just have the surgeon to mark on the needle. Uh, we should design needles which have maybe you know marks on them so we know exactly how far we have gone into the uh, tissue. Um, I think that uh, I, I actually think Yamani technique. He has explained it beautifully here, and I think if you follow those principles, uh, it can be done very well. Um, one last thing I'll mention is people don't understand the value of infusion. The VR surgeons are all using posterior infusion, no problem, but for the cataract surgeon who's not familiar with infusion into the eye, in a vitrectomized eye, this can make the procedure very difficult. We prefer posterior infusion, but many anterior surgeons are not comfortable with this, and they use an AC maintainer, which is okay, but not as preferable. But without any infusion in a vitrectomized eye, the globe is very soft and hard to manipulate. And so, I think that's an important point to mention when we do these techniques. Number one, do a very good vitrectomy, but number two, ensure the infusion is still given to the eye during the eye wall fixation. You just now answered my next question. Actually, uh, Doctor Teen from Myanmar, he he had asked, "What are what are the tips to control the intraocular pressure with the AC uh, maintainer during the haptic externalization?" So I think you've already answered that question. Doctor Sanjay Patel is there. His comments. um i i mean i think i think you've covered everything here i would certainly uh echo what dr ike just said about um infusion uh we use anterior or posterior infusion but that's that's critical in the eyes a fake it can and vitrectomized so um i don't have much more to add thank you thank you so with that we'll uh, move to the next question uh, uh dr hitesh uh, wants to know which is what is the ideal time uh, to put this to do the secondary eye procedure uh, be it after trauma or after your um, primary surgery so you can begin with lg sir or anybody can take this question <clears throat> i i didn't exactly understand what, what do you mean by when you should if be... you're doing it as a secondary placement of iol So, if you've had a trauma, you've done the cataract surgery, or you've uh, removed the lens, traumatic cataract, and uh, when, when do you plan the next surgery? Or if you've had a rent, and uh, you want to plan uh, the surgery as a secondary procedure? I that's I think it's any... related to trauma because it doesn't make sense for the primary uh, surgery after the trauma. When when is the time to do the secondary? At, at any stage that the patient is undergoing surgery, even if suppose there is a patient with a subluxated dislocated lens with retinal detachment where you are fixing the retina as well as managing the dislocated lens At the same time you can do everything you can do a yamanes retinal fix i will fix the retina and put in gas or oil and whatever it is it does withstand all the rigors of vitreoretinal surgery 
the IOL, once it is fixed, it does not get dislocated easily. So I, I have done co combined surgeries where scleral fix IOL done is the same time as the retinal detachment fixation. If you, uh, so sequence, you may have to change a little bit in the sense you fix the retina first, do fluid air exchange, do the laser, reinfuse fluid, then fix the scleral fix IOL, and then subsequently again, do a fluid gas exchange to fix the retina. Otherwise, it can be done at the same time. Likewise, if you have a PC rent or a zonular dehiscence in the lenses, uh, you're not able to place IOL, regular IOL. At the same time, you can do anti vitrectomy or vitrectomy and do a scleral fix IOL. I don't find any reason why you have to do it on another day. You can do it at the same time. Sure, sir. So uh, the next question is about uh, pseudo paper donators with this uh, with each procedure of suture. How does it compare with the sutured uh, sterile fixated IOL, uh, sutureless uh, sterile fixated IOL, the movement of the IOL? One of the delegates wants to know, audience wants to know the possibility of pseudo paper donators, uh, whether it's been studied with this technique. Where, either with uh, Dr. Yamane's technique or uh, with the modifications that you've uh, uh, discussed. Is there anybody else answering? If not, <laughs> you, you can, sir. Answer. You can begin. You can take the lead. No, I, I don't think pseudophacodonesis is a problem. It does not happen. But even with, because I was using the tenzero proline sutured IOLs of the CZBD with the ILET for the last 15 years almost before I switched to the Yamane technique. With either of the techniques, I don't think there is a problem of pseudophacodonesis. As I said, I was combining it with vitreoretinal surgeries very often. And I don't think it's a problem at all. But in fact, the gas, even fluid air exchange, it will withstand without movement. It, it stays quite still. The problem of pseudo occurs if there's your sutured IOL, the suture starts getting degraded, then yes, the IOL can start hanging down. Otherwise, it is not a problem. So in the short term, it's quite a stable procedure. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is it's very, very not stable. Probably pseudo is the only issue I was, as I was discussing earlier with iris fixation lenses. With, uh, that's probably because iris diaphragm is not, I mean, it's mobile a little bit. So then vitreoretinal surgery and fluid air exchange or oil injection, that's the issue. But otherwise, whether Yamane techniques or your suture fixation, once it's placed properly, usually I, I, that's not an issue during surgery. You Again, you need to modify a little bit because air can uh, seep into the anterior chamber. So do it before doing fluid air exchange. You just a little bit subtle modify uh, your technique, but I think comfortably managed. So with that, uh, yeah. we have completed... Yeah, the uh, pseudo fecal donors is also an issue with the two point fixation technique of the suture iron. So, wherever the suture disappears, previously we used to do the two point fixation. That time there was this issue of pseudo fecal donors because of the tilt around the axis. But now, with the recent techniques of four point fixation, with the coop and the anti coop uh, suturing technique, this pseudo fecal donors is not an issue even with the suture iron. I think with that, we have uh, come to an end of the uh, uh, panel discussion from the audience uh, questions. We'll move to the uh, literature search part of this topic. Uh, I'll, and, uh, I'll invite Dr. Uh, Srivali Kaza to uh, share uh, her literature search. Actually, we've got lots more questions, uh, but uh, just taking the session forward. And once we have uh, finished all the talks, we'll come back to the questions uh, of the audience. So this was one of the things that we just found uh, when we were uh, trying to read and learn about the Yamane technique. And it, uh, this uh, group from PhD Institute, uh, Coimbatore, and uh, Pacific Clear Vision, Oregon, USA, have uh, claimed that they must be the first a case presentation which they have done, which they have refixated a Yamane fixated lens. And uh, what they claim is that it was a little too anterior uh, and uh, causing iris chaffing, and uh, hence there were pigment granules dispersion, which was causing decrease in um, visual acuity along with uh, uveitis uh, kind of problems. So they have uh, out the lens and then fixated it after moving uh, posteriorly, like going around 1.5 to 2 millimeters stresses the fact about uh, the correct placement and the uh, 
that have to be the limbo, which uh, uh, what Dr. Peter and uh, Dr. GSR sir were uh, letting us know. Uh, any comments uh, about this from Dr. Yamani? Any comment from any of the panelists about uh, uveitis? If it's too anteriorly placed, yeah, I, I think that that's the problem with making the uh, the fixation points too anterior. So I. I I don't think, I think two millimeters is too anterior personally. So I prefer to go more posterior. Okay, yeah, that's what everybody has been telling us. Fine, thank you. And we move forward. And this was another uh, novel technique that we came across from a group from China, which they have called it as a sutureless intrascleral haptic hook lens implantation using a 25 gauge focus, in which they have taken the, uh, the schematic diagram is actually self-explanatory. So uh, they have taken out the haptic and then actually, instead of putting it in a kind of pocket, which has been shown by Dr. Prabhu Bhaskaran or making a plunge, they have turned it back inside and again pushed it to, into the vitreous. Uh, but now this free end would be lying in the vitreous. So uh, um, I would like to know the comments from the posterior segment surgeons about uh, how correct this procedure is going to be or uh, uh, would it cause or does it uh, act like a wick and would this have a little more risk of infection or endophthalmitis? Anybody has done uh, this particular technique? I think there is... Uh no increased risk of endophthalmitis because everything is intraocular but definitely there is a higher risk of uh, uveitis because you have this now free uh, end of the haptic which is poking and which is a relatively blind procedure and it's lying in the sulcus so it could rub against the ciliary body and cause recurrent uh, hemorrhages or uveitis even it can cause glaucoma and um, my other concern would be you're manipulating the haptic too much. I mean, already the haptic is under stress when it comes out from uh, intraocular into the sclera outside. And now again, manipulating it back inside, it's too much of a distortion of the haptic. And I'm sure uh, it would have uh, some telling effect on the haptic optic junction in the long run. And that's one of the concerns about these SFIs because these SFIs are not really meant for SFIs. These are all uh, three-piece sulcus IOs which we are now playing pulling the haptic outside and putting it into the sclera. So we would like to wait and see for the next 10 years, 15 years, what is the effect of this on the haptic optic junction. But uh, Dr. Yamane did show that uh, with uh, his uh, uh, model experiments where the haptic optic junction does uh, tend to hold on to the uh, stresses of the pull and push. But I have had cases where uh, just the intraoperative manipulation I have uh, did, uh, caused the disengagement of the haptic intraoperatively. Uh, so it's not all that simple. I think we'll move to the next session. Uh, this, uh, we'll come to yeah. So uh, to begin the second session, uh, I'm very happy to invite. Uh, a good friend and a colleague, Dr. Chetan Rao, a senior consultant. Uh, Dr. Shivali, can you? Yeah. So, Dr. Chetan Rao is a senior consultant with Vitroretinal Department at Shankar Netralia. And uh, for uh, many of uh, us anterior segment surgeons, he is our go to surgeon for the sutured steel fixated IOLs. And uh, he is trained in VR surgery at Netralia. And now I invite him to give his uh, presentation on sutured steel fixated iron, Dr. Shetan Ram. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shiga, for the kind uh, introduction. So I shall share my slide. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, uh, uh, 
after listening to such uh, such an elegant surgery such as the yamana yamani's technique uh, it looks like the sutured skill fixed into intraoperative lens uh, would appear to be a very uh, uh, gross kind of surgery not so delicate as in what we have been seeing in the videos so but we do have indications for uh, the sutured skill fixation of the intraoperative lens so uh, we know these indications uh, we all know that but uh, with a special mention for uh, childhood aphakia secondary to uh, post lensectomy i for uh, various reasons such as the conoidal cataract uveitic cataract or traumatic cataract even the ectopic lens and the descended i all the sutured intraocular lens is a uh, is a very good uh, option but there is a uh, there is as uh, dr pramod was uh, telling us there is a caution when we actually want to use uh, a sutured uh, sfl because it's going to be a we are hoping that it will remain permanent inside the eye so there is going to be a lot of uh, relevant anatomy that we have to take care we all know that the ciliary body get, uh, takes a little while to get uh, mature it's almost complete by 3 years but however the past then it continues to grow uh, it's almost uh, adult uh, size by the age of 5 and but still it continues as the eye, eye elongates and there usually we see a myopic shift uh, uh, in the refraction after the age of 6 so we prefer to defer any kind of uh, sutured unsutured still fixed in intraocular lens in the beta ray cage group minimum after 5 years of age so that aside uh, let's just uh, briefly talk about the history so we know that a sutured intraocular lens was first described by uh, malbern et al we had a lens guide which uh, where they guided the tenzoroproline uh, suture uh, uh, for the iol fixation either the open sky or in a closed section and then we have uh, the two point fixation of uh, fixation of james lewis where he used the uh, avex uh, external sulcus fixation uh, with a flap and without a flap and then we have numerous modifications just as we have for the yamanis technique we have numerous modifications of the suture the uh, the iol uh, types and and the indications for the uh, for the sutured uh, skill fixated iol so what are the basic principles of the sfl for any iol and for that matter the iol size that is including the haptics should be bigger than the horizontal coronal diameter and the placement of the haptics ideally should be close to the ciliary circles if not a ciliary circles uh, the suture used to fixate should be a high tensile strength Uh, you should not be. Uh, you should. You don't want it to break while you're manipulating it uh, uh, inside the eye, and it should be non-degradable. Hopefully, it lasts for long, and uh, the the eye will stays in its place. The lens should be centered for the uh, uh, visual axis and should have a minimal tilt. Any tilt above more than ten degrees will uh, uh, will cause a lot of astigmatism, which is uncorrectable. So, what are the IOS designs that we are uh, using for a uh, sutured uh, type of sfl we have the rigid pmma lens uh, what we here in shankaretal is the oro lens which is around uh, uh, it is got a 6.5 mm optics so obviously the section is going to be large to introduce the io in inside the eye and it has a uh, large uh, haptic diameter is around 13 mm which is uh, uh, quite large and it almost uh, if you have to look at the sulcus to sulcus uh, uh, diameter which is around 12 mm in most eyes is it's just about fits beautifully into the sulcus and it has a small uh, posterior uh, angulation so the iol is uh, is, uh, uh, is angulated posteriorly so it, it mimics something in, inside the back so it remains away from the iris if you place it correctly uh, and in the us uh, there are uh, uh, reports of uh, people using the acreos lens though the uh, haptic diameter is small uh, it is held is usually used for, uh, with a gotex uh, suture this is a flexible io so you can usually uh, you can use a smaller section incision like 3.5 fold it and then put it inside the eye it's a uh, it's an io which is a mixture of pmma and hema combination there are special situations where uh, we uh, we don't have uh, an uh, iris it's got total aniridia we can actually use uh, this modification of the io which is got a an opaque uh, pigmented surface with an open 6 uh, uh, mm uh, central uh, clear area Uh, in cases of iol uh, and aniridia so let's come to sutures that we use uh, uh, the sutures that we use uh, have to be monofilament uh, non absorbable 
and the most uh, common ones are the 90 proline or the 10 proline and uh, the advantage of this uh, proline suture is one is a very uh, small gauge it has a uh, very straight sharp needle so it uh, pierces the sclera very well and uh, and you can uh, manipulate outside the eye using uh, other instruments the only problem is it's a little brittle while handling so if you tighten the sutures and if you pull a little uh, tug a little hard uh, while tight uh, while uh, putting the knots you can break it and then you have to do the whole procedure again and uh, also its long term durability inside the eye so in uh, this particular uh, uh, group uh, they have found that there's a breakage of almost uh, more than 25% of cases and uh, in a period of 2 to 5 years uh, we have fortunately seen uh, our breakage issues a little later around the 8 to 10 years uh, we have seen in our own cases where we have done a sutured desophile with a proline so we have modified to use uh, the 90 proline or shift over to something called the gortex uh, uh, now the gortex is a polytetrafluoroethylene uh, suture it's actually uh, used for uh, cardiac surgeries where they sew in the uh, cardiac uh, large vessels of the uh, the uh, the uh, heart and uh, it's a very durable uh, suture really thick suture it's got a high tensile strength so you can easily manipulate it in uh, tie knots without the fear of breaking it and it's got a very high surface tension so that that means it is got a it's it, it can stick to the eye uh, to the uh, uh, to the eye will have thick as well as to the eye itself and it's uh, as i said is durable the only problem is when you tie it you get a very thick knot and this knot is very difficult to rotate it inside so uh, and you might have to uh, actually make a spill uh, flap to so uh, to cover the knots so there are a lot of discussion regarding the ciliary circles and the placement so this is a very elegant uh, uh, study done by uh, dr takeshi et al and uh, they've actually found out uh, they've actually used an endoscopy uh, to look at the ciliary circles this is what it looks the figure on the left hand side shows you the uh, the ciliary sulcus which is actually bound by the iris superiorly and posteriorly the uh, ciliary body processes come together they fuse to form a kind of a, a, a margin here a, a dead space here now if you look at the posterior surgical limbus if you draw a perpendicular line across it it's the schlem's canal around 0.5 mm behind is the ciliary sulcus but then you would have to actually if you had to enter the ciliary sulcus you'd have to go perpendicularly into this and uh, enter the eye so what we surgeons generally try to do is try to go horizontally so this is what uh, this is where comes in that uh, the 2.5 mm and the 2 mm insertions of the needle into the eye which passes horizontally across the uh, sclera and enters the ciliary sulcus if if you have directed the needle just along the posterior surface of the iris so this is what i meant so this is a, uh, the, there is an uh, a very elegant uh, 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 what do you call injector of the needle uh, which is called a ciliary uh, sulcus pad which uh, houses the needle which you have to push inside the eye and it goes and sits within the uh, sulcus and gives you uh, an accurate placement as it comes out of the eye 2.5 mm uh, outside the uh, posterior to the surgical limbus so this is the uh, uh, the basic landmark which is very important uh, when we surgeons we have to use the needles if we are trying to place a sutured uh, 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 sutured uh, we are doing a sutured as a file we need to use a suture the needle uh, as a uh, horizontal along the posterior surface around 2.5 mm that's when we actually uh, traverse the uh, ciliary sulcus but then uh, uh, we know there are a lot of unpredictable uh, th- uh, factors like for example the iols Uh, uh can be slack the sutures are slack and uh, and sometimes the anatomy can be little uh, different from the, for each individual and this uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy comparison of uh, the lens fixations shows that almost 75% of cases they actually uh, are not within the uh, sulcus they are actually around the pars plana or the pars ciliary body or somewhere uh, tucking the iris uh, anteriorly so the another op, another thing that we have to actually uh, talk about is the tilt management we as i said before 10 degree tilt is something which can be tolerable and can be corrected with glasses but so uh, to maintain the uh, uh, the tilt uh, we need uh, something uh, something like the torque anti torque management principle so if you see your iols if this patient is in the uh, sitting posture if the iol is this uh, the haptics are at 3 of 9 uh, o'clock and if this is the axis of rotation in the center 
the when we place the eyewells uh, when we place the suture we uh, we use the one eyelet uh, we use a needle going below up from one eyelet and the other eyelet goes above below and this effect actually gives you uh, uh, the sutures go on the opposite sides go over the uh, axis of rotation from one side this is the if suppose you just imagine this is the anterior part of the uh, uh, the uh, the lens and this is the posterior part of the lens so in this the suture goes anteriorly and in the suture goes posteriorly over the uh, edge of the uh, haptic so this actually in uh, in effect gives you this so both the, uh, when the suture is pulling down it's actually causing it's like a seesaw the seesaw here is pulling down and the seesaw here is pulling down so it's actually keeping the eye well in the uh, in the vertical uh, posture so let me just uh, brief you about the techniques of the uh, sutured uh, tenoproli so we have after you mark the uh, 180 degrees uh, uh, for the facial flap you make a tunnel which is around 3 mm to uh, 3 mm in uh, width and uh, around 2 point uh, or 2 to 2.5 mm behind the uh, uh, the post as a surgical limbus you insert your tensor uh, proline uh vertic uh, horizontally as i said just behind the post surface of the iris you've already made a section and you use a needle uh, to uh, receive this uh, uh, hollow needle to receive this uh, uh, proline uh, needle exteriorize it go under the haptic on this side and then reintroduce the needle uh, uh, the tensor proline needle to the section and receive it on the opposite side uh, the other uh, uh, point of fixation so this becomes a two point fixation on this side And the similar thing we do on the other side. The only difference being this needle now is coming from above below, and then we uh, finalize the sutures. And you see, this is uh, how it is uh, uh, in the dead center uh, with the still flap, which is then uh, closed, uh, either closed with sutures or used fibrin glue to, uh, to prevent any leakage. So this is a short video. I just go quickly through this. So you make little tunnels. Uh, I was uh, explaining, and uh, after you make tunnels, uh, then you uh, you have done a good vitrectomy, clear the uh, axis of uh, all vitreous uh, cavity, and also uh, close to the uh, to the flaps. You introduce the needle through uh, upper part of the flap. Now this point, the point entry that is there, uh, usually uh, should be equidistant from the central uh, marker. and uh, we just push the uh, the iol through the haptic and now it's being introduced inside so one loop is done on one side similarly we do the uh, the other side and after we have uh, done it from uh, the, uh, the uh, push the needle in the above below direction of the other haptic we push the uh, the eye will inside the eye uh, and rotate the eye will into position or the, the uh, push the eye into position just so that this haptic goes behind the iris and does and you must always uh, mind uh, the haptic should not be kinking the iris otherwise you will have a irregular pupil so look out for irregular pupil which will tell you that this iris is uh, this uh, the haptic is not in the right position you can always use a dialer go inside the eye and uh, push the uh, eye well into a position like uh, the surgeon does it here ensure that the uh, eye well is in the right uh, place finalize the uh, sutures a 311 suture is done the knots are then uh, rotated into the still bed and then the flaps are either sutured or uh, uh, Fibrin uh, glue is uh, attached. Fibrin uh, glue is put to uh, uh, make sure there is no leakage. So this is a, a video which shows about the uh, the Gore-Tex. So uh, the, uh, the Gore-Tex uh, sutures a little uh, thick and uh, does a, uh, does need a little bit more preparation than the Proly. After you make the tunnels. Uh, we have already done a vitrectomy so you can see the three ports and uh, we have marked uh, around uh, 1.52 mm on either side of the central marker and uh, what i have been doing is uh, 
the placing these uh, uh, trocars these are uh, valve trocars in these uh, as a 25 gauge uh, in the position that because the gore-tex is a little uh, thick uh, suture so it needs a little uh, uh, manipulating uh, manipulation through the sclerotomies so after you place these uh, uh, so uh, these cannulas open the section so once you've done that and uh, you've introduced your uh, gortex to that so i go by uh, a pattern i put the uh, inferior uh, uh, sutures first pull it out with an intraocular forceps now these uh, sutures will go uh, below up along uh, one uh, haptic and then above below on the other haptic and then i will reintroduce the uh, these uh, suture ends into the uh, i and bring it out remove all the cannulas tighten the uh, make a knot tighten the uh, introduce the io making sure that it remains parallel to the io surface at this point of time i must uh, uh, make sure that the, the squeeze section is closed the iop is uh, well maintained it's tight before i finalize suture so that i don't have any slack in the in the sutures as you can see it's very difficult to rotate and the knots are big so and then i use uh, glue to close the uh, uh, the squeeze flap and the pad uh, and the conjunctiva so just wanted to highlight a few points that is important when you uh, make a uh, when you do a sutured uh, uh, as a file you do not have to make a flap always you can always make a groove as well which is around 2.5 mm away from the post surgical limbus but i do a flap and uh, the the only point of the flap is it should not be too uh, thin otherwise your uh, knots are going to get exposed by uh, friction or the bed should not be too thin or you can have the between the between the entries of the uh, your uh, uh, sutures there can be cheese wiring and the it can become uh, the io can dislocate the haptic should not touch the iris so people should be round uh, uh, when you place the uh, io while tightening the suture the globe should be tight so you should have a infusion going in and uh, not uh, and no leaking uh, incisions try to rotate the knot as much into the sphere as possible so that there is no knot sticking out uh, and then the steel flaps can be sutured or glued this is bring if the suture cracks are leaking and conjunctiva should cover the flap uh, well so common early co uh, complications are uh, uh, there can be hypotony very often we see optic capture uh, raised iop can also be a, uh, a, a seen with two to three day later uh, two to three day later usually in the first week conjunctiva displacement can happen exposing the steel flap and if it is not healed well there can be leakage and sometimes which is damage can happen because of damage to the ciliary body at the time of uh, iol insertion uh, there was a uh, there was a large uh, there was a review of all the intraocular implantation in the absence of zonal support done by uh, the american academy of ophthalmology and uh, if, if it regards to safety they found there is no difference in the uh, safety between the sutured and non sutured techniques they've tried they've uh, seen all the uh, articles uh, talking about uh, the sfiles including the sutured sfile and uh, with regards to long term complications we have seen uh, this is our uh, publication in uh, uh, sutured sfiles in pediatric eyes they, these are all the complications are less than 5% and uh, like the dislocation of sfile as well there are uh, regional detachment uh, very rarely end of filmitis and so it's a very safe and these are all uh, uh, comparable with the adult group uh, where we use a sutured uh, sfiles so why would have actually we have all, already seen uh, dr yamane's uh, technique has been adopted uh, for a wide variety of uh, ca uh, cases and uh, situations 
But where would I really uh, apply the sutured uh, fixated, uh, still fixated IOL? Would be in cases where there's a uh, disorganized anti segment, there's a RS tissue loss, there's no disorganized pupil, cynical closures, or there's a total anaridia where I can use an anaridia SFIL. Extensive congenital scarring at the horizontal meridian, you know that you need a, a mobile congenital at those points to have a Yamanis technique to be useful. Or uh, when you want the uh, IOLs to be uh, uh, long term, because we, have, uh, we may have around uh, eight, uh, eight to around five to eight years of experience with the Yamanis techniques, and we really don't know how long they last within the, uh, uh, in the eye. And uh, so in a younger patient, along with the Gotex suture, where I expect them, uh, the iron to remain for a long period of time, I would prefer that. And of course, uh, what I've done uh, in a literacy search, uh, we find that a lot of surgeons say that uh, if you want a more reliable post-operative refraction, uh, the sutured fixated intraocular lens is a better option because it shows less tilting and uh, uh, more accurate placements. And uh, yeah, so now this is just a case I wanted to show. This is a disorganized anti-chamber with an IOL, which is uh, capturing the uh, uh, the iris versus on the right hand side you can see uh, in a case of trauma with a last uh, uh, corneal scar we have an IOL which is uh, well centered. So thank you for your uh, patient listening and open the questions. Then uh, we do have a lot of questions uh, regarding all the types of sutures uh, and the techniques, uh, but we'll be taking up the. Uh, uh, questions after Dr. Ike's talk. Um, so I just want to uh, introduce Dr. Ike. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Ike. It's early in the morning in Toronto and he has agreed to be a part of the whole session even otherwise. Um, <clears throat> he is currently an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and a clinical professor at the University of Utah. He is a trained glaucoma as well as a, a surgeon and his uh, uh, main USP is complex cataract as well as glaucoma surgeries. And uh, he's uh, had a, a feature of top 40, under 40 of uh, Canada's ophthalmologist at a very young age itself back in 2010. And recently he has been awarded the innovator of the year and also recognized as the third most influential ophthalmologist in the world by the news magazine. Uh, we are uh, privileged to have you here, Dr. Raik, and uh, I welcome you to present your talk on your take and the decision making regarding. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, say my greetings to uh, all my friends in India and around the world. As many of you know, this is my heritage. Uh, my parents uh, are from uh, India, and uh, so it's very warm and wonderful to be with all of you. I wish I could. Uh, visit more often. So once we get past this uh, pandemic, we will be together. And uh, India always makes an amazing presence internationally at all the meetings. So I think it just goes to show even at this meeting, uh, the amazing innovation and skills that, that uh, my sisters and brothers have from India. So congratulations, really, really amazing. I feel proud to be part of the, uh, the heritage um, and I'll continue to try to represent that way. Hamara Hindi achenehe, so Angrezi bolenge. So I'll speak English wow. here because my Hindi is not very well. But if you force me to, I can try. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start with my presentation here uh, and talk a bit about um, different techniques for IOL fixation. Um, as you heard earlier, there are a variety of approaches, and the literature is quite mixed in terms of what is preferred versus the other. I think that these all need to be customized. This is my city in, uh, in Toronto, um, and I hope that uh, you, some of you can visit anytime, let me know. Well, not now, of course, but maybe later on this year or in the future, I hope. These are my disclosures. So I'm gonna focus a little bit about um, iris sutured uh, versus uh, scleral sutured approaches, dealing with um, secondary lenses or repositionings. And these are uh, techniques that we use every week uh, and we're very indebted to the innovators out there who have taught us many approaches. Um, this is just an example of a patient who's had a three-piece lens placed in the sulcus after an IOL exchange, and the lens you can see has, has, has subluxed. I find these are, uh, particularly the ones that are out of the bag like this, three-piece lens, 
uh, are very amenable to either refixating to the sclera or to the iris. Um, this patient also has uh, some diminished corneal endothelium. And in these cases, I think the preference is to avoid an anterior chamber lens. Now, I will say that for certain patients, we don't talk about it, but an ACIOL is reasonable. Uh, I, I use angle-supported lenses in very old patients, and I also use the artisan lens a fair amount. Uh, we have published uh, a while, a long time ago on um, the uh, primary uh, implantation or secondary implantation of a three-piece lens to the iris. And I think it uh, goes without saying that instrumentation is important. We heard it earlier. Um, if you need to, you can steal a forcep from your vitreoretinal surgeons, or you can uh, grab a specially designed instrument like these that are designed primarily for the anterior segment with different length of the forceps and a bit more rigidity and curves that are helpful for the anterior segment. Uh, in my preference, when I do any kind of iris work, I still like to use 10-0 proline and I use the CIF fork taper cut needle. I find this to be an ideal needle to avoid larger buttonholes through the iris and 10-0 polypropylene seems to be fairly durable. Unlike the sclera, we find uh, that uh, suture degradation and suture breakage is less, not, not, not zero, it does happen, but less than with uh, fixation of proline to the sclera. Um, there are a variety of ways to suture uh, these lenses to the iris, and I recommend learning many of these. Um, there are many different approaches that can be used depending on how you like this. Some, some of course, and is popularized by Agarwal, just uses a four throw, but the technique of actually passing the suture are all pretty consistent. This is just an approach that we use a lot, which some of my former fellows have called McAhmed, would basically we pass the needle through the iris we bring up both ends of the suture out of the eye. And whether you do a four throw or whether you use a locking throw, it doesn't matter. This can be done in either way, but we use a micro tying forcep to do the, the throwing. This makes it much easier to basically pass the suture not into the eye as we slide it in through the incision and we can then cinch it down. And if we wish to leave it like this, that's fine as a four throw or we can lock it. Uh, going forward, we also use some uh, intraocular tying techniques, which again, you can use to do a fourth throw if you wanted to, or you can use to do a locking. I like to lock the sutures, particularly when I'm suturing the, uh, the lens to the iris. So this is, the, this is that case. You can see the, um, the, the patient has an eye weld here. You can see this sublux, the capsule support is minimal. And I think this is really ideal. The iris is normal. There's an iridectomy fine. And I'm basically going to plan on placing the optic in a pupil capture position and then placing a myotic in the eye to capture the IOL in the optic in the pupil. Lifting of the uh, IOL optic is important because this allows us to visualize the haptic and pass the needle that has been placed through pre-arranged paracentesis to take advantage of the long needle trajectory of this CIF4 needle. It's important not to place the suture needle too close to the pupil to avoid pupil localization which is a common problem with these techniques. And you can see we're basically now passing the uh, needle through the iris under the haptic. And then I like to dock the needle out of the eye. Same thing for the remaining haptic, lift up on the optic with the second instrument. You can see the outline of the haptic, get to the mid periphery. You don't have to go into the angle, it's too far. And then pass it through with the docking needle. Here we're gonna use the intraocular tying approach. You can see we're tying the sutures into, into, inside the eye with both ends. This does require, of course, instrumentation like micro tying forceps, as I showed earlier. Um, and there is a little bit more of a, of course, technical uh, approach with this, but I love the control. Here, we're gonna basically take a Coogan hook in this case and externalize the both ends of the, uh, of the sutures. And here we're gonna use the McAhmed approach, where basically we do a mechanical type of suturing outside by basically rolling around the micro tire with three throws. And then we slide the knot into the eye. This is a very straightforward approach and I believe it provides great control. Uh, again, if you're happy with four throw, you're done, right? With four throws. But before I lock the suture, however, I do place the optic behind the iris and I bring the iris above and you'll notice that the pupil is ovalized. Don't be overly alarmed that this happens because of iris being trapped in the knot. This is why I don't lock the knot first. I pull the iris away from the knot to distract it centrally and this allows for a circularization of the pupil. Uh, this, is, uh, this is quite common. 
And I know many surgeons have abandoned iris suturing of IOLs because of pupil ovalization. But this is how we can avoid this. We can then cinch the knot again and lock the knot. Here we're going to again use an intraocular tying approach. Uh, I think the use of micro tying forceps is very handy to manipulate the iris. And here we do a locking knot in the reverse direction to lock the knot. I do like to say I like to lock the knot. I think it's an extra couple of minutes, but man, you got security. The knot will not unravel. Uh, and I even put a third one here just to be sure, because this is, again, not just suturing iris. We're actually suturing the haptic to the, to the, um, to the iris here. And then we do the remaining uh, as well. We have externalized both ends of the suture, uh, do a locking throw, and then slide it into the eye, right? Lock and slide, and we're good to go. Uh, we trim the knots with a pair of micro scissors, which is nice to use through small incisions. We always like small incisions here. And we there have a nice lens position. You'll notice the sutures that are present in the mid periphery. Uh, and you'll notice on the ultrasound by microscopy, we see the position of the lens. You will notice the lens is positioned here with a 10 degree vault because of the haptic vaulting to the optic. Remember, the actual lens is suspended to the iris by the haptic. And therefore, there is generally a set distance between the optic and the iris. This reduces the risk of iris chafing as opposed to, for example, a sclerofixated lens or a sulcus lens because the lens is suspended. So it's a fixed distance from the iris. Chafing could still happen if the lens is tilted or if, if it's decentered, however. Dilation is not a problem, of course, if the people, patient has normal dilation. And again, as I said, we have published on this. Um, on the other hand, when we have in the bag lenses like this, and I think maybe we'll talk about this a little bit, I think that this is a good example for an in the bag lens where uh, a scleral fixation is reasonable. We've already heard of different approaches for secondary lens fixation. When the eye was in the bag like this, I like to support the lens with a couple of iris hooks to avoid tilting and twiddling of the lens as the suture is passed. I'm making a vertical groove. Now, a vertical groove helps us to avoid the issues around tilt. And we pass the needle pass, as you can see here, through the groove. Uh, the first pass you can see is made through the posterior capsule and anterior capsule uh, around the haptic present here and pushing the needle forward into the anterior chamber. Whenever I suture to the sclera, whether a secondary or repositioning, I always, I shouldn't say always, I very commonly use Gore-Tex suture. Uh, the needle is large, it's a bit of a pain, and I'm using a 25 gauge needle to dock, which is a bit of a nuisance, but I think the suture breakage is really, really rare. Um, you can see the groove is made. Um, the first pass is made uh, here, uh, two millimeters from the first pass, second pass. This, the second pass you can see is going above here, and I make sure the second pass is at least 1.5 millimeters back from the limbus here. Uh, again, to center the lens as we plan on the zonular plane. We can talk a lot about landmarks here. We heard earlier some good discussions about this. And the entry of my needle, you can see, was perpendicular. The entry was perpendicular, but when I passed the needle into the eye, was was iris plane. So be always mindful of how we enter. There's the suture wrapped around the haptic. This is where we have to be very careful not to tie the suture too tight. Otherwise, this is, again, a loop and the suture may slide along the haptic and we lose the fixation because we're using the capsular bag fibrosis to hold the, the, the suture, but it's not enough if we pull too tight. You can see again, we're passing both ends of the, uh, of the suture. Here's one behind and one above, and this allows for uh, good fixation. This is all done through small incision, and very commonly, we do not need to do vitrectomy when the lens is not terribly subluxed or terribly dislocated. This is one advantage again of this approach because the lenses are often sitting on the anterior hyoid. although it's important to, of course, ensure we look and we manage vitreous as necessary. Abundant viscoelastic is helpful. Now you can see I'm doing a slip knot. A slip knot allows us to type it the tension of that suture depending on the, on the centration of the IOL. And then we can rotate the knot into the sclera, which is very important. I don't make flaps. I like a groove, it's fine, but it's very important to rotate the knot into the sclera to avoid erosion, and this has been my standard approach. Uh, again, public, we published different series on this. Um, with the approach, you can see we can, in this case, we're using a circumferential groove. If you do this, it's important to make sure that they're alternating in terms of which suture is behind the uh, lens itself to avoid tilting as well. 
Like I said before, I use the Gore-Tex suture. It's the CV8. It's a 7.0 equivalent um, suture. This is my predominant approach. I will say for maybe like 80 plus year old patients, I use a 9.0 proline. It's easier to manipulate. It's easier to use the needles. But for the majority of patients, I like to use the Gore-Tex suture. Here's a UBM showing the fixation of the same IOL. And we have good positioning of the IOL here, centered here, positioned and fixated here. Again, I am not plan. This is a mistake I like to mention here. The plan is not to fix the lens in the ciliary sulcus. No, that's too anterior. We want the lens to fixate at the zonular plane, which is basically essentially equivalent to the ciliary processes. We don't, we don't, we don't want the lens to be so anterior in the sulcus. Um, so that's an important point to mention. I know people mention sulcus a lot, but that's not the approach for that, for that there. This is just another example of a lens that is completely dislocated. And just to, just to show you what we can do with these lenses, that even though they are very, very posterior, we can do a vitrectomy. We can elevate the lens. You can see how far back the lens is. You can't even visualize it. We can bring the lens forward. This patient has a previous RK. And we can bring the lens forward with the vitrector on aspiration after vitrectomy is done. Grab the lens with a pair of micro forceps here and then use the pre-placed iris hooks, which have helped, of course, for pupil dilation and the small pupil here, and place them on the rex's edge. Uh, this allows us to suspend the lens temporarily to fixate the lens. I, I think there's no need to take this lens out. We fixate it to the sclera. The lens is fine. The zonas are the problem. So fix the problem. Don't throw the whole baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Now we make our grooves. This case, I'm making circumferential grooves. This you can see is at least 2.5 millimeters back from the limbus, although I like using the uh, end of the blue zone as a landmark. Again, we don't have enough time to talk about those things. Um, but here I'm making passes here above and below um, the haptic. Notice the first pass was made here inferiorly um, here um, to uh, go under the bag. On the temporal side, you'll see we're going to go here on the superior side. So therefore, we alternate which haptic is going below the bag to avoid tilt because we do have uh, the, the suture making a 90 degree turn around the capsular bag. Again, a little complicated to hear that, but we heard earlier that, that diagram, which was important. Uh, again, same idea. We have the suture passes. I'll just tie the knot. And you can see that we have good control here. There's a knot. We're going to bury it. And we have very good fixation of this patient. There's the lens there. Uh, and it's positioned nicely here behind the iris. This is just a summary to show you the different approaches. It's a busy slide, okay? We have angle ACIOLs. We have artisan lenses. We have iris sutured lenses. We have scleral sutured lenses. We have haptic fixation. And they all can be differentiated based on the proximity to the cornea, angle concerns. Do we need the iris to be present? Suture breakage is a concern. Infection tract, tilt, denesis, pupil ovalization. They need to do a vitrectomy and technical ease. And each of these, you can see where I have positioned it. For example, of course, an angle supported lens, again, the one issue is this proximity to the, cor to the cornea, um, but we don't need to do big vitrectomies with tilt is less of an issue. There's no infec infection track and no suture breakage. Technically it's easy. On the other hand, iris suture lens, as you can see, we avoid the need to do a big vitrectomy, but we need to do some. Pupil ovalization can be a concern, and donesis can be a concern when the iris uh, may be fairly mobile. Tilt is somewhat of a concern, but less, for example, than I think uh, haptic fixation or scleral fixation lenses, and there's no infection track. So these are just some options here. Again, this is my own anecdotal experience. We can disagree on it, of course, as well. So thank you very much, and of course, please always keep in touch online. More than ever, we need to be together, uh, social media, does have its ills, of course, but it's a great way to keep in touch and share and just be part of the human spirit in getting through the pandemic together uh, as a family. Thank you. Hey. Let me Thank you. That was an excellent talk. Really, really enjoyed the talk, uh, Dr. Rai. Uh, we'll come to the discussion uh, later on. We will uh, move to the uh, next uh, presentation, which is uh, by Dr. Kiranjeet. Dr. Kiranjeet Singh is uh, a director at uh, Dr. Diljeet Singh Eye Hospital, and he specializes in management of cataract and glaucoma. Besides being a brilliant surgeon, he's an innovator and avid golfer. 
and i think is comp a company by his brother dr ravi ji who is also a, a director at dr daljeet singh eye hospital um, and uh, they will uh, uh, tell us more about the iris claw lens uh, i invite dr kiranjeet singh to present uh, his video Uh, th uh, thanks a lot, Doctor Shekha. I have to uh, share my screen at first. Yes, please. Please share. So, am I audible? Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Uh, it's you're audible. Just make it a, a full screen. Okay. Okay. Play. Yeah. So uh, I have been assigned the job of talking on secondary IOL as an RS claw as an secondary IOL. So firstly, I will like to talk about those big lenses, uh, which were implanted in seventies, nineteen seventies or eighties, and they had a claw little placed superiorly, which was the cause of uh, pseudo phacodonesis and uh, which uh, had a long term bad effect on the endothelium. But as far as I'm concerned, I have been using small lenses ever since. And this is a case which I did 28 years ago. And the child was just three months old and did a iris claw, small iris claw lens. And after 20 years, the endothelial count is 2200. And after PRK, uncorrected vision is 66. And if you enclave more of iris, the stability is much more. And these are the sizes which I have with with me in my operation theater. So the bigger the eye, the bigger the lens, the smaller the eye, smaller the lens. So uh, the RS claw has bailed me out of many situations. And just I'll sh show you some scenarios. The patient came to me with an angle supported lens with an IOP of 45, with Iris Bombay with ECC of 500. Uh, how do you go about it? Uh, so I did a YAG laser, PI, and uh, with the help of some topical drops, control the IOP. And uh, then I exchanged the uh, angle sported lens with a small sized uh, iris claw lens. And after a month, so, month or so, I sent the patient to my friend who does DSEC. He did the DSEC. So he did the DSEC. The patient came back with 618 vision. So this movie is about uh, uh, interior iris claw fixation in which vitrectomy and lensectomy has been done and uh, simply make a three millimeter or 3.5 millimeter uh, uh, tunnel, send the lens inside vertically, rotate it horizontally, uh, hold it with a vertical forceps or a and forceps. And with the help of a needle, you enclave some iris and this small sized iris claw lens is away from the angles. This is away from the cornea. And iris claw lens implantation hardly takes a minute. And there was a tail of vitreous. I take the vitrector below the, through the iridectomy, do some vitrectomy, and the job is done. So this is a case from, referred from some other hospital, case of microcornea, fecia, because while he was doing the PCIL implantation in the bag, the capsular bag was very small. So he could not implant the lens in the capsular bag. He had to take out the lens. He sent the patient to me. After a month, I did the iris claw lens. This is a very small lens. And uh, you can see the amount of iris I have been cleaved in. And you can see that horizontal line. That is the line through which the lens was expanded. Now this child is in the cricket team of the blind school. Uh, this is a child in which the same thing happened. Uh, the lens would not go into the capsular bag. The patient was sent back home and a custom fit lens was ordered. The patient came after one month. We opened the incision. The, there was synechia, posterior synechia. And uh, you, you do some interior vitrectomy and membranectomy. Uh, and then slip in the lens, which is uh, just 4.5 millimeters in 2.5 millimeters and hold with a Clayman, Clayman forceps. And on one side, two pushes and the lens is fixed. And on the other side, two 
you switch hands and switch the forceps also and this is a time taken to implant a lens and these are micro cornea very small eyes and there is no pci well which can be implanted in the sulcus or in the lewd lens uh, scenario uh, because it is going to be very risky so again uh, this lady a girl comes to me 13 years of age with uh, using spectacles 20 diopters with vitreous in the pupil and this is a, a scene there is vitreous in the pupil there is no lens uh, which can be fixed to the ciliary sulcus uh, scleral fixation so what i did was simply did a vitrectomy and put a small size lens in the uh, next to the peri uh, pupillary edge it hardly takes 2 2 3 minutes and look at the smile on the child's face so this is again a patient 7 mm uh, corneal diameter uh, coloboma behind below and did a pupilloplasty with a vana scissors put the lens and uh, the patient was fine and this is a micro cornea uh, coloboma and black cataract did extra cap and uh, uh, i had to cut the iris on the other side also and did the retrofixation of a small lens so this patient comes with me uh, to me with a tender eye because of the posterior vaulting of the angle scoted lens and you can just imagine the size difference between two, the two iuls uh, i explanted the lens implanted the iris claw lens did some vitrectomy and membrane dectomy then the patient remained uh, normal thereafter so when you have a big uh, eye you don't need to worry because the lens is going to remain the same because the lens holds the eye it is not the eye which holds the lens so in xfo if you have a bag which is dislocated or zonules are weak and you put a pcil you will have a bag lens complex in the vitreous after 2 3 years possibly but if you have a loose bag no need to put a pcil just implant the lens after the faco put more of iris and take out the bag from the main port main incision so this is a girl who 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 was of marriageable age uh, we put a lens 55 diop diopters and after putting this pc i will of 55 diopters she still had a refraction of uh, 10 diopters so we had to put a, a, a lens of she had a uh, refraction of 5 still 5 uh, so we put a lens of 10 diopters and she became emetropic in both eyes 624 vision she got married later on so this is a secondary iol so simple main incision two side stabs constrict the pupil and slip the lens vertically in and uh, hold it with the clayman forceps the edge, the tips of the clayman forceps should point towards the claws take it behind and push the iris iris goes inside in two strokes one side is done and similarly other side would be done by changing hands and changing this um, uh, this these forceps and the time taken is just 1 minute you can easily visualize how the iris is going inside the club so this is a post op picture so now i am going to talk about uh, i think i am done with the top today's topic but i am going to show you something uh, which we uh, enumerated last week and that was uh, the patient comes to with a injury and uh, the iris has been cut because it has prolapsed you do a very good faco but there is a there is a, a space uh, there is a coloboma traumatic coloboma how to deal with it it's so simple with iris claw platform so this is a iris claw platform uh, this processes this is you can call it processes just push iris inside it and uh, on both sides and you are done with it so the patient will not have photophobia this uh, iris processes need some further designing so that the claws they don't come into the pupillary area 
and uh, we'll have better design in the future and thanks very much for attention thank you dr kiran ji uh, it was a very informative uh, talk with lot of innovation uh, we will move on to the uh, audience questions in this session uh, there are lot of uh, questions around uh, uh, iris claw lenses if you will go through this uh, slide uh the uh, questions are uh, whether it can be put if you've had a rent and you can uh, do it as a primary pr procedure just place an iris claw lens and if you're doing that uh dr harlinkin singh wants to know whether you need to remove the pc completely to get the correct angulation and uh, also he wants to know whether the posterior iris claw lens can be tucked anteriorly if required so to begin with uh, uh, we'll start the panel discussion around these questions uh, dr shivali can you just uh, stop sharing your screen yes i think dr kiranjit you can uh, answer uh, these questions and then we'll move to the panel so uh, can you ask me the uh, question one by one yeah the question was whether if you somebody has had a rent and a yeah, large yeah. rent can can it be just placed I, i i'm sure it can be placed as a, as a primary yeah. procedure what the doctor yeah, yeah. wanted to know is whether we need to remove the pc completely whatever is left you need to clear it and then place it any specifics about it no no if if it is just if it is just a pc tear you don't rem have to remove the capsule at all but if 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 it is uh, something uh, pseudo exfoliation a case and then and the bag is loose then it is justified to remove the bag before uh, before or after fixing the iol otherwise you just just need to do a vitrectomy little bit of interior okay. vitrectomy okay i think i just make one point here that uh, and it was raised here that that very often we have patients who are aphakic and they have significant somerings ring present hmm. if this is the case and we're using anything behind the iris whether it's iris claw or whether it's uh iris for, or suture fixation or any other type sclera fixation the one of the big challenges honestly is sometimes removing the somerings ring especially if you're not doing a full vitrectomy so um i think it's just an important point there are different ways to do this uh we can do it manually it's not easy often to uh to use a vitrector to cut the uh somerings it can be difficult So those are some of the things that are important. I, I have to say, I I I love Dr. Singh's comments. Uh, I'm a big fan of the iris claw lens. Uh, I think it's a fantastic place for the anterior chamber as long as the cornea is okay. I I think it's a great approach for some of our older patients when we do IOL exchange. Thank you, Dr. Ike. Uh, the other question was uh, whether the posterior iris claw can be fixed anteriorly. It's the same lens which can be. Yeah, it is the. My question. It is open a, to the panel. It is the same lens, actually. It's the same lens which can yeah. be placed anteriorly or yeah. uh, can be uh, done posteriorly. Only thing is, is a different A constant. Yeah, A constant. You know, you have to increase the power. Yeah, it's 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 the lens position that decides the final refraction. Uh, uh, now the question: Do I, anybody else in the uh, faculty okay. has? Uh, can I can I ask a no, question no, to Doctor no. Daljit? I am a cornea consultant from Netralia. Your technique is very interesting. I have uh, seen that. Uh, I just want to ask you: In those eyes which has very small uh, horizontal cornea diameter, and you go ahead and put uh, the iris claw lens. do you consider the anterior chamber depth is there any way you include that in your measurements and uh, challenge whether to fix it anteriorly or posteriorly does that depend on the chamber depth uh when i have a chamber depth which is less i always go for retrofixation otherwise i go for interior interior fixation and uh, and i have innovated one more uh, uh, device out of this iris claw lens which has five claws and uh, it has an optic also if there are synechias in the interior chamber angle you put that uh, optic with those claws five claws and i uh, pull those iris from five points from the periphery 
from the angle so the angle open up opens up and the chamber becomes deep and there is no fake odonesis i can show you in a while if you feel like um uh, but it is it because i am putting a small lens it does not matter because i am quite away from the angle i am quite away from the, the cornea and the, because the lens is so small it is not going to uh, do any uh, fake odonesis not going to harm the cornea at all so it's it's a lens that's therapeutic for glaucoma and yeah, yeah. closure glaucoma yeah yeah doctor i cure a glaucoma specialist your comments on that i have to say there are some people who don't like the iris claw lens i am a big fan honestly of course if someone has uh, iris abnormalities or a poor cornea then we have to be careful um but in that case i agree you can do retro iris um i i think no. it's i think it's it's very helpful in fact you're absolutely right sometimes for angle closure we pull the iris from the angle and we enclavate it in the in the in the in the uh, iol and it acts as traction on the uh, on the angle on the tm so i think it's a potential this, opportunity yeah, there yeah this, this is really oh. a novel point that uh, five oh. uh, five points the iris is being pulled from the angle and it's like you're opening up the angle mechanically uh, shika can i just can I ask a question yeah. um uh, uh, dr ike if uh, fixing up the uh, iris claw lens behind the pupil is safe and easily learnable why uh, bother about fixing it anteriorly considering the fact that we could sometimes have um, messes in terms great of great question so here here's a couple of points i will mention i'm interested in what dalji thinks first of all to do a posterior enclavation we need to do a good vitrectomy first of all So there's an advantage in not not going behind because you don't need to do any or or little vitrectomy. Number two, um, the one downside of this lens is dislocation. It does happen. I've seen it happen. It can happen over years from minimal trauma. Of course, it's important to pull enough iris through the uh, through the uh, claw, but it can happen. And when they dislocate, of course, it can be quite difficult because it's falling quite posteriorly. So um, those are some of the reasons why. Uh, I'm a little bit careful. The last reason is theoretically on the anterior surface of the iris there's less concern for chafing than on the posterior pigment epithelium. Although I don't think it's a major concern because the lens is vaulted, there's some theoretical benefit in going on the anterior surface. So I I my personal opinion is young patients I don't go anteriorly. I go posteriorly. But older patients I I we have a lot of eyeball dislocations, 80 year old dislocation, cornea is nice, healthy. I I find no problem I can do it without doing much vitrectomy in that case. Uh like I said before when there's a big somerings present uh I have to take it all out. Sometimes I just I just decide to leave it and just put the arsen on the uh, the uh, iris claw on the anterior iris surface. So those are my my decision points. It's a good question. Doctor, uh, Doctor Ike, uh we do routinely ICLs and uh, we have a cutoff of 2.8 ACD. Do you suggest something like that? to in before selecting a iris fixated lenses. Yeah, fortunately these are these are all basically aphakic patients. So they're all have anterior chamber depth that is going to be more than 3 4 mm except of course for the very anomalous eye or microphthalmic eye. That's a different story. Then I think it's different. Otherwise in normal eyes fortunately the ACs are are very deep. They're deeper than in the aphakic situation as you mentioned there. So you know Uh, there's no le- no perfect lens no question there are problems with the lens too but those are some of the things and against my own opinion i i could be wrong in some areas too i think yeah, i just um, wanted to make a point sir please no i i mean as a as a vitreoretinal surgeon i'm a little concerned about the small eye oil and the small people which can never be dilated properly because the eye oil itself is very small and if there is a retinal problem examination and management can become a little bit tricky that's the only point i wanted to make oh, yeah there's I no problem that... dilating though you can dilate the pupil whatever you want i don't know dalji no. what do you think dalji no, no i'm i'm not questioning about dilation but when the when the eye oil itself is small there is a limit beyond which it cannot dilate right the pupil can dilate quite like you can you can dilate the pupil beyond the lens i mean the lens the pupil will be ovalized but if the pupil dilation is normal i have pictures i'll show you people can be dilated beyond the actual optic itself now doing vitrectomy is a nuisance because you have the interface you're right about that mm-hmm. 
But the pupil dilation is really a function of pupil dilator muscle, not of the lens enclavation. Only where the points are enclavated, the pupil may not dilate fully. But otherwise, the pupil dilates quite well. Dalji, what do you think? I think the pupil dilates well. Yeah, it dilates in an hourglass fashion. So it will, it will not be oval. It will be hourglass appearance of the pupil after you put some um, mitratic. Yeah, yeah I mean, problem. basically... So there's basically, a little yeah. compromise in the dilatation. Exactly. So there, there is some compromise and it will affect sometimes the management of posterior segment yeah. and you may end up removing the eye oil if you have a retinal problem. That's okay, but I just wanted to make it a point. So. Also, I it adds on some parallax actually because sometimes during vitrectomy because in a, like a optic age, no pupil dilates, but vitrectomy sometimes can be tricky a prismatic effect and you can lose your depth perception. You have to be extremely care. It's not like you cannot manage, but you have, you have to keep that thing in mind and care you have to just move accordingly. Manipulate True. your I, I agree. Yeah. So, uh, with that, we'll go to the next question. Uh, that is uh, Can I add? Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, though many people, uh, anterior segment surgeons like uh, retrofixed rivals, one of the main concerns is in the learning curve is the posterior dislocation during the procedure. So for this, uh, what we came up uh, for the younger surgeons is we can make a sutured loop either with a uh, 8-0 Vicryl or at a 6-0 Vicryl to the haptex so that uh, the fear of a posterior dislocation during the procedure will be less. And uh, we can easily pull out uh, if there is something happens in one haptic like that. What we call this as a safety suture technique, maybe uh, this can be used uh, in the learning curve. Valid point. Very uh, nice. Another, another uh, question uh, from the audience is, how do we compare the iris claw lenses with the uh, SFIOL, sutured SFIOLs and uh, sutureless SFIOLs? So uh, my question to the panel, uh, LG sir, Dr. PB, Dr. GSR, um, Dr. SAR, uh, how, uh, I mean, like, uh, what is your uh, take, and, uh, take on all these, uh, so, so many options that we have of doing uh, secondary, uh, I'm sure there's a place for all these techniques in uh, different patients. There, there are different situations where one may work better on the other, you know, over the other. LG sir? I'm sorry, I was, I was away for a short while. I didn't. I didn't yeah, so it's question. basically how do you compare the iris fixated? Uh, uh, previously, ACIOLs were also uh, considered one of the. Now, gradually, it's fading out the role of ACIOLs. Now, we are left with the in secondary options the iris claw lenses and the scleral fixated IOL lens. Uh, so, how, how do you. What's your take on both? How do you compare them? What's. Uh, uh, which I mean, situation, I, which uh, uh, technique should be used? See, if I am doing both the techniques, it's, it's fair on my part to compare. I don't do both the techniques. So I don't think I can compare, really. If a person who is doing iris claw lenses regularly is very obviously very happy with this technique. While I do mainly scale fixated lenses, so I'm very happy with that technique. So I why are you not compare. doing iris claw? Why aren't you doing? I'm why why sure. didn't you ever try I, iris claw? I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, but... I'm happy with scleral fix I will, so I continue to use that. Because I somehow Fair feel a little uncomfortable try, trying to handle the iris too much. So, I mean, in the, in the past, has, as has been already discussed, that there used to be patients with a lot of endothelial cell loss. So I'm always concerned about that. I'm obvious. I am, I'm aware of the fact that things have changed now and the new IOLs, especially retro iris, Exit, I was probably yeah, there safer. is a, some amount of uh, uveal tissue handling and it's yeah. associated with inflammation and CME and exactly. all the complications. Exactly, exactly. Dr. Kiranjit is not agreeing. No, with I, I'm sure in, the, in his hands it works very well. That's why he's continuing yeah. to do with that. So I don't think yeah. there's any one straightforward answer as to what you would do. I think what you are most comfortable with you would do. That's what I would put it as. Yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you make a very good point. I think everyone's going to have the best technique in their own hands. And there's no one that can say this is superior to the other. Um, the E should be, should be done. I, I do agree. Somebody who has a CME risk or iritis, I avoid the iris. But I will say, uh, I think that the risk of iritis or CME is very low with the iris claw. But still, but still I'd be cautious 
and I place the lens on the sclera if I, if I have a choice. There's only one randomized study that's been done, as far as I know, between iris sclera and AC lenses. And the iris group had the lowest CME rate, lowest CME rate, believe it. So I think even with scleral lenses, we can get CME as well sometimes. Uh, so we don't have the answer, but I do agree with Gopal that I think if I have CME risk or iritis issues or concern, I avoid touching the, the uvea. Although the scleral lenses are still touching the uvea going through the ciliary body, but I think it's maybe less a concern. I think just to add one more point that the CME risk with sclerotic cyroids is more common when it is done by the anti-segment surgeons who don't perform a full vitrectomy. While as a post-segment surgeon, we always do a full vitrectomy and I have not had CME as a complication of sterile fixed eye wells, almost never. Because I do routinely OCTs for all these sterile fixed eye well patients, but I have not seen any CME as a complication of that. So there was a meta-analysis in IOVS published in, I think, 2017, July, which uh, compared the iris claw with the um, sterile fixated eye wells. They included seven studies and uh, the safety and efficacy and including the complications like CME, RD, and um, hypotony, or, or everything was comparable between the two groups. So, I mean, uh, probably some of the anterior... I just want to make a point. Since uh, Dr. LG sir brought about the topic of anterior segments, uh, surgeons performing the SFI well, I'm a cornea specialist. Uh, I have been doing SFI well um, close to a decade now. And uh, use, initially, I used to do the four point fixation sutured uh, SFI well. And, uh, re and uh, about five years or so, I have started doing Hoffman pocket. I don't think see that in the topics today. So. We do routinely um, Hoffman's pocket for uh, PKIs, where uh, it's very important. These are complicated cases where uh, we need to preserve as much as conjunctiva as possible because they could re require uh, retinal or uh, glaucoma interventions in future. So in Hoffman's pocket also, the four-point fixation is possible. I am a fan of four-point fixation. and. Uh, once you uh, learn the technique of how to deal with the sutures, because that's the basic uh, uh, road blocker for learning it, uh, then it becomes very safe. So I just wanted to add that. So it's not about who does it, it's about how it's been done. No, 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 that, that's not what I mean. I, I didn't mean that anti-segment surgeons are bad surgeons or anything like that. What I'm trying to only say is that a thorough vitrectomy tends to reduce the risk of CME. That's all I'm trying to say. While if you don't do a thorough vitrectomy, there's a risk of CME. I'm not saying it's a bad technique, not at all. Okay. Thank you. It's good, to, ha it's good to have some debate between the front and the back of the eye. Good to have some debate, right? You know. <laughs> uh, there's another question uh, related to what Nivedita was saying uh, from UK Dr. Bala Ramaswamy. He wants to know in a four-point steril fixation using vortex suture, what is an ideal separation between the sclerotomies on each side to ensure that the IOL is not folded up and is well centered? So anybody in the panel who would like to take this question? I, 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 usually, I usually go at least two millimeters. I just want to add, uh, because I'm uh, learning now, I'm switching over from proline to Gotex, so I, I think I that is one Nivedita, of the just a minute, just a minute. We'll finish this question, then we'll discuss come to Gotex. And the point here is what is the ideal separation between the sclerotomies on each side? So yes, uh, Dr. Aiki was saying. So I mean I I typically use about a two millimeter distance between the suture passes um, when I'm doing um, that technique. That's my preference. Yeah, I think. The, GSR, sir, PB, sir. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, see, there's no fixed criteria, no fixed study, uh, any specific study. But I agree with Dr. Aiki. That's what I do. Approximately two millimeter. I mean, not approximately. Probably the center point you have, and then one millimeter on either side. That's what my measurements would be. In two byte, it's around two millimeter gap. I, I would add that I actually place mine three three to four millimeters apart. Sanj is going to add controversy. We, we need controversy here. Let's stir it up. So we, we have another anterior segment surgeon with us doing uh, uh, SFI wells. Dr. D.A.D., would you like to give your comments on this? Yeah, yeah sure. 
see uh, with when you are doing a three port vitrectomy with sclerosis fixation and sometimes it is to be combined with some glaucoma surgery etc there is actually not much space for you to do all these flaps and sclerotomies plus section plus strap etc so sometimes the space is limited so what dr ike said about 2 mm distance between each is enough so you mark the central point and just go 1 mm on both sides so that serves the purpose so 2 mm is the answer पैनल Uh, iris fixated yet though uh, and neither scleral fixated because i have retinal surgeons at my uh, two feet my distance to need it uh, that is required but uh, when you are doing a sulcus fixated iul uh, in the iul in a sulcus uh, would you uh, recommend uh, removing the somering string completely So it's a great point. I mean, you're talking about somebody who's had previous lensectomy and then they have uh, a fakia and they have a capsule shelf present and you put the lens in the sulcus, right? That's I think that's what you're yeah. speaking about, Smita, right? Yes. I uh, I do worry when you have a big somerings because we see tilt sometime of the lens because the somerings can be asymmetrical or the lens can be pushed up and it can cause chafing. So that's one reason why I'm a little bit reluctant to place a lens if there's a big somerings ring and leave it in the sulcus alone uh, you can get away with it yes but if it's very dip, very big and thick it's a problem i like to do ubm before doing any kind of uh surgery so i can assess the sulcus assess the capsular bag assess the capsular shelf assess somerings ring present and if there's a concern you have a big fat somerings you see these right uh then i worry about the lens being pushed against the iris but otherwise if you don't have a big somerings i think you can do that and ideally use optic capture if you can if you can have a opening in the capsule because somering string especially if you have done a primary posterior capsulotomy sometimes uh, it it's like a big calcific uh, stuff there and it's very difficult to aspirate or use the vitrector i mean sometimes you have to just bring it out through your section you have to do it manu- always, manually yeah, yes and there is always a risk of it going down because there is already a pre existing posterior <laughs> capsulotomy and uh, it's 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 really a nuisance well that's that's oh. that's why that's why you'll hear a surgeon say just put a iris claw lens on the anterior iris and you're done you the know you worry about cornea worry about cornea i see San, San, sanjay smiling because he's like watch my cornea with the anterior chamber lens which is a valid concern but as far as technically speaking yeah you certainly have an advantage of not having to touch somerings no but not to, uh, also additional point here is so many times you have excessive fibrosis and that extensive fibrosis and if we try to pull that out with a strong zonal uh, we have a couple of cases landed but landed up into giant retinal tear so we have to be careful like this yes hey the problem with iris claw lenses in children is there isn't enough long term studies available yet Uh, that's the evidence is really thin about how they for do that, that matter none of the uh, secondary no, no. iols uh, i think the longest we have uh, uh, dr shrivali you found out was the 5 years right we don't have any any yeah. study with a longer follow up than that no we have is unpublished as if data on 6 year but all of them have been sulcus fixated in the iols and uh, yes the biggest problem was glaucoma 18% Yeah, so okay. the, on literature search, what we could find was a five-year follow-up of a secondary iris claw uh, lens, and uh, also a comparative analysis of iris claw versus scleral fixated in which uh, from uh, a group from Chennai and from Pondicherry. But what they have shown in this particular uh, study is that their uh, comparative uh, best corrected. Dr. Shrivali, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I may, shall we move to the next question? Yeah, so this was in relation to what had uh, have been discussed and you want to take these questions, Dr. Shikha? Yeah, you'll have to go back to, uh, one slide back. So uh, the next question is by Dr. Uh, Madan Gopal and uh, his question says that patients with SFIOLs are usually disturbed by these scleral and conjunctival sutures and have significant symptoms in the post-operative period. And this takes away the satisfaction of completing a complex surgery with good results. Since suturing cannot be completely eliminated in uh, SFIOL surgery, I would request the panelists to provide tips to minimize suture-related symptoms. So uh, comments from the panel on this. You can use uh, to, seal, to seal glue, fibrin glue is an option. But honestly, I, I use a beautiful tenno vicral suture, bury the suture nicely, and like we do for glaucoma surgery. And usually, it's not usually a problem if you bury a suture nicely, like a nice uh, monofil monofilament uh, vicral or glue. I agree with no, because fibrin we use uh, particularly for Gotex because that uh, opening is large, sometimes it leaks. But uh, yeah. Otherwise, if you are conjunctival closer, you can use fibrin, but it adds on a cost. But when while taking suture, I think routinely what we do, you can have a take a first bite from inside out and not can goes in. So that definitely minimizes. There are ways to just minimize placing the suture. It's not really that big issue. I think. If you if you make oh, a clever speak, pocket, uh, idea, please. yeah, if you make a scleral pocket instead of the scleral flaps, the pocket doesn't need to be sutured. So you are uh, uh, the scleral fixation suture is inside the pocket and the pocket is anyway uh, well, uh, uh, it, it lies flat. So it doesn't require any sutures at all. And the conjunctiva, you can always use the glue to close. So I, uh, really there is not much problem with the sutures post-operatively. LG, sir, any comments? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything special. Dr. Patel? Yeah, I... Um... I don't actually make scleral flaps or Hoffman pockets. I just use a loop of suture across full thickness sclera and then rotate the knot into the eye. And the Gore-Tex is actually very low profile. It doesn't cause any problems. So, so that eliminates suturing scleral flaps and then suturing the conjunctiva, you just uh, uh, create the knot such that it's buried. Yeah, the, the one thing with Hoffman pockets, and I, I have a bit of a strong opinion and I apologize, but I. The one thing with suturing to the sclera is tension is so important, the tension you place on it. And I find that the tension titration under a Hoffman pocket is not as easy as on bare sclera, where you can really type the tension adequately, what you need to, what you need to have. And so I've generally gone to using a direct view. I, I, like Sanjay, basically, I don't make a flap. I do make a little groove, mind you, but whether it makes a difference or not, I don't know. Um, but I like the ability to type the detention so carefully. I find this to be so critical. Um, some techniques are more critical than others, but I find that the control of tension is important. Actually, I yeah, didn't actually, use Hoffman pockets. Well, just a second, I yeah. didn't use Hoffman pockets. I just meant that instead of uh, uh, using, a, using a scalpel blade, bed, a blade to make a scleral flap, you just make use a crescent knife to make just a, a scleral tunnel kind of a pocket. So like how you make for the FACO incision, a scleral tunnel, a similar uh, thing can be done for the fixation of the, uh, the scleral sutures. So that doesn't require any suturing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah as you said, just... Hoffman pocket, uh, it, it does have that problem of uh, uh, visualization when tightening, I agree with Ike. But uh, since I always combine it with a PK, I have the um, possibility of uh, titrating once the PK sutures are complete and the globe is tightened a bit more. So I just keep it flush to the surface. And then when I reform the chamber and fully tight, it, it is snugly fit. So that way it helps. Uh, just uh, Shika, one point I would like to add mm -hmm. here, what Dr. Aiki said, just to going back, when you finalize the suture, scleral fixation suture of IOL, 
the restore normal anatomy of the globe and eye pressure is very very important when you that fine tuning you do you and that's why you ensure close your limbal sac like a cataract section you have infusion maybe on whatever if your infusion line is there ensure eye is having a normal pressure and then no nothing leaking there and then you finalize your suture before you put a final knot and rotate the suture otherwise one side can get pull more or less not only like i will decentration can have a tilt and astigmatism those issues can be there okay so with that uh, shall we move to the uh, one slide i think uh, dr shrivali you have of the literature search a very interesting innovation yeah would you like to share that and then we'll move to the next session last session yeah thanks dr shikha so uh, we've already discussed the long term follow up but this was a new going to be coming up or it's already uh, being used so it's a, a single piece uh, hydrophilic foldable iol uh, with these flanges which have been designed so that uh, from the pocket these flanges are just pulled out and that's it uh, that's how it just fixates they have made this angulation in such a way that there is no iris chafing and they have uh, uh, down and the left side up so the leading upper side uh, dents on this so that we uh, as it's unfolding itself the surgeon would know whether it's unfolding in the correct uh, direction or not this is from uh, italy and so i would like to know about uh, any of the panelists if they have used this lens and uh, their take on this um dr lg sir no i have no no experience sorry anybody else in the panel it's a it's a new lens fine so I, with that i, uh, I have we... not i've not used this lens but i i would just say caution with hydrophilic acrylic especially if patient may need retina surgery or cornea surgery Uh, because they can opacify with gas bubbles. Mm -hmm. There was there was one uh, presentation of a similar lens made in India. I think somebody from Karnataka actually has is, uh, is is developing an IOL of the same design where you have the flanges on either side, which are pulled out and they're left. Uh, but I'm not sure whether it's been published or not. i think shikha somebody has the, the videos which you sent i think one of the videos i think you are having a similar uh, lens being used uh, video submissions what we have we, so we will have the judges comments uh, in the last session on this okay so with the, that the carla valley uh, lens is interesting as you as you've heard and i i think i do agree with the concerns about a hydrophilic lens um same reason why i don't like using the acrios lens for suture fixation like has been described before um but i know that carlevel is is designing a hydrophobic material so that that is either available in europe or it will be available apparently and that'll perhaps answer that that issue the idea and it, it seems like a pretty elegant approach actually so i'm i'm looking forward to looking at seeing more results and getting experience thank you dr rai so with that we'll move to the last session and uh, i invite uh, it's my honor to invite dr uh, sanjay v patel uh, to give uh, his talk dr sanjay patel uh, is professor and emeritus chair of ophthalmo ophthalmology at mayo clinic in rochester minnesota we all know mayo clinic is one of the best hospitals in the world and uh, he uh, was a department research director from 2009 to 2012 and department chair from 2012 to 2020 uh, he's uh, his expertise is in corneal transplantation imaging and clinical trials and he's authored more than 140 peer reviewed publications and he has served on the editorial board of ophthalmology since 2013 so welcome uh, uh, dr patel and uh, uh, please tell us uh, more about the anterior segment uh, surgeon's perspective of management of dislocated iols over to you 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, well, again, thanks to uh, the, Dr. Shekhar, Dr. Shrivali for inviting me. Um, I'm really primarily a cornea surgeon, but over the years I've been sent uh, all the complex cataract and complex lens and so have developed really an anterior segment practice. So this is an anterior segment perspective uh, for dislocated lenses. Um, I have some disclosures, none of which are irrelevant. So I really just want to focus this on two aspects. First of all, we, we should be able to prevent dislocated lenses, then we never have to manage them. Uh, but sometimes we're going to get thrown something that we don't have a choice and we do have to manage. So let's talk about preventing dislocated lenses. This is um, from a study that we published a couple of years ago. This is what we call an Olmsted County, Minnesota study. So for those of you not familiar, um, I'm in Minnesota, which is the north central part of the US and this tiny county down here is called Olmsted County and that's where Mayo Clinic is. And we can uh, look at population-based epidemiology um, while we see patients from all over the country and all over the world. This study just pertains to those that, that live um, in our in our specific county. So it's it's more generalizable to the to the general population. And when you look at um, population-based indications for, for lens exchange, by far, most of them are done for dislocated intraocular lenses. And the leading causes um, are as highlighted here, which we will, we will run through. So first of all, um, how do we prevent the need for doing a lens exchange for a capsule tear? That really comes down to cataract surgery technique um, and uh, improving, improving your technique, improving your outcomes, preventing posterior capsule rupture. Um, prevent that and maybe the lenses don't ever need to be replaced. But sometimes you're faced with things that are out of your control. The zonular weakness from, from pseudo exfoliation syndrome is, is very common here in, in Minnesota, but there could be other reasons. Um, and I've kind of shifted over the years, having been forced to fix these, to have a much lower threshold for placing capsule attention rings. Um, I do remember when they first came out, there were comments made that they should be placed for every patient with pseudo exfoliation syndrome. And that, that didn't make sense to me, but my, my threshold has gone down. And the reason for that is um, whether it creates stability or not, which it probably does, it gives you a piece of hardware to fixate uh, in the future if needed. Uh, and I'll show you that. As a cornea surgeon, I see all the patients with corneal edema. And this is a patient um, that had complicated cataract surgery, uh, a lot of phacoemulsification time, uh, ruptured zonule, anterior chamber lens was placed poorly and the iris is now incarcerated and the, and the cornea has failed. So how do you prevent some of these? Well, sometimes old fashioned works well and um, resort to extra cap surgery where the corneas uh, look beautiful the next day. Uh, and rarely, you may even do intracap surgery. It's not very common, but occasionally still happens. Then this is a, a I think, a syndrome that we need to talk about more. Um, basically, this is iris chafing, and it's from square-edged IOLs. The popularity of these IOLs is such that this is actually an increasing problem and so when IOLs that are meant to be placed within the capsular bag are not placed properly, um, years later, you can find yourself in a situation where the eye is in trouble. And so most of the lenses that are foldable and, and acrylic have these square edge profiles. And uh, if placed in the sulcus, they can chafe against the iris. Um, and here's actually uh, one of our residents placing a lens and he's very junior in his training and um, he's placing the lens and he 
hasn't quite realized that this trailing haptic ends up in the sulcus. Um, and so you have to instruct him to say, dial that lens and make sure it's in the bag. The point here is it's very easy to do. Um, it shouldn't happen when you're as dilated as this, uh, but junior surgeons may miss this. And it's just so important to check for at the time of primary surgery because you can save yourself a lot of trouble in the future. This is the same problem. Uh, and this was done by an experienced cataract surgeon who didn't realize they left the, the trailing haptic in the sulcus and the haptic is tilted. And fortunately, this patient uh, presented early with profound inflammation and uh, I was able to blow the bag open and tuck the, the square edge haptic into the bag um, without any difficulty. But often these patients show up years later and it's, it's not as easy as that. This is a patient, this was a 79 year old male. He, he's a vascular path, has significant heart disease, anticoagulated, had cataract surgery in, in, in his right eye a few years ago, followed by his left eye after a month, uh, complicated by a ruptured capsule, dislocated lens, then required a lens exchange, developed a choroidal hemorrhage, total retinal detachment, and then lost all vision. And a few months later, he's referred to me for the first eye because he's now 26 D with uveitis and hemorrhage. And here's what his eye looks like. Um, and so this is the classic uh, translumination defect from a square edged haptic and the sulcus. The capsules actually ruptured. So this surgeon actually ruptured both capsules a month apart in both eyes. The lens is tilted. Um, so this is a problem and this is a sick patient who's anticoagulated and very unhappy and we don't have good access to iris claw lenses so we just took this lens out, did a very quick 27 gauge vitrectomy and actually left him aphakic uh, and he was happy for the, for the remaining six months of his life. So uh, sometimes you got to think about what's right for the patient. So prevention's great, um, but a lot of the time you're faced with situations that are out of your control and you've got to deal with a dislocated lens. And for me, it's the variety, uh, it's, it's the spice of life because they come in multiple varieties. And here's um, actually an unusual case. This is an anterior chamber lens, very difficult to see because of corneal edema, but there's an anterior chamber lens that sunset because the haptic fractured within the eye and this haptic is incarcerated, um, same eye here. But sometimes the anterior chamber lenses look like they're well-placed, but they, they may be rotating, causing corneal edema. Um, sometimes you have a PC IOL that is hanging by a thread and ready to dislocate. And again, I'm an anterior segment surgeon, so I don't do three port vitrectomy uh, and I need to think about which cases I can do by myself and which ones I, I do in combination with a retina surgeon. Sometimes the lens in the bag wants to prolapse anteriorly uh, from zonular loss. And sometimes uh, you just have a sunset three-piece IOL in the sulcus. This lens was placed after a previous lens was exchanged. You can see the cut haptic and the, the bag is actually intact. And this lens actually is is not uh, 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 deformed in any way. It's just, it doesn't fit well. And then the worst ones are, are the plate haptics that are in the bag that are dislocated and uh, they're probably the biggest nightmare. So um, when you approach the management, I'd suggest that you think about these four things. What is the actual cause, which we've somewhat covered already and the anatomy what type of hardware do you have in the eye? Um, what about the patient? We, we've talked a lot about techniques, but we should think about what's right for the patient. And based on all of those things, determine the surgical approach. So cause and anatomy is, you know, where is the IOL? Is it, is it an anterior chamber lens? Is it a posterior chamber lens that's still anterior? Is it a posterior chamber lens that's ready to fall? Is it um, a lens that's in the sulcus, a lens that's in the bag? Um, is the capsule um, 
ruptured and is the lens entwined in vitreous because that's going to determine your approach um, is this on ruptured and is that global weakness focal weakness what's the overall stability of the iol i usually take teach the residents here to um, make sure they lie the patient down in the clinic tip them back in the chair and look to see how how far back does that lens go uh, and is it is it stable is it retrievable from an anterior approach by hardware, what type of lens is it? Foldable or rigid? What's the haptic style and integrity, the size of the lens? And as we said, um, is there a capsule attention ring present? Sometimes this is hard to see because many of these eyes don't dilate well, but wide dilation can help um, and review of operative reports. And, and um, when I have a lens bag that's um, dislocated and it's got a capsule attention ring in, I'm, I'm smiling. What about the patient? You know, doc, Dr. Ahmed talked about patient age, and I, I completely agree that age is a factor for me as to what type of lens I will place in the eye. And there are still times I'll place an anterior chamber lens, uh, not as frequently as I used to do. Um, age is also a factor for vitreous. And if I'm going to suture a lens, I like, in a younger patient, I like to have a formal vitrectomy by a retina surgeon. Uh, and we protect the, the retinal periphery. Um, and then think about what are the comorbidities, cornea, uveitis, detachment risk, are they anticoagulated? Many of these patients are older and have cardiopulmonary disease and how long do they need to uh, be in the operating room? So all of these things will determine the surgical approach. And you should ask yourself, can you simply reposition the lens can you refixate it? Is it scleral versus iris? Or do you need to exchange the lens? And then where are you going to place the new lens? And should it be, uh, at least uh, in my case, an anterior approach or a combined approach uh, uh, with a retina surgeon? But one thing that's changed for me in the last decade or so okay, is yeah. every eye in the future, if it needs a cornea transplant, deserves to have okay, endothelial deserves uh, to have uh, endothelial keratoplasty um, uh, as opposed to penetrating keratoplasty. And that for me has pushed me towards placing more uh, scleral fixated uh, posterior chamber lenses rather than anterior. And I teach the residents the same when they're having trouble during cataract surgery. Sometimes it's best maybe just stop, clean, clean the eye out, leave it aphakic and then let's decide uh, where we want to place the lens uh -huh. based on the patient's risks. Mm -hmm. So on that note, here's two eyes with anterior chamber lenses oh. and, and corneal edema okay. and, and fixing these for me. Yeah. Um, I like to take the AC mm. lens out, suture uh -huh. a, a posterior chamber yeah. lens, and then follow with, uh, with a DSEC. Mm. Um, so again, I've gone away from anterior chamber lenses, but not always. They still have a role. This was a 94 year old, 94. Um, and she had poor vision after a fall. She couldn't read, she loved to read. And the left eye was uh, essentially blind from a, a, a vein occlusion. And she's anticoagulated, she's a vascular path. Uh, she's got good vision potential if we can restore her vision. Um, and her lens is completely dislocated. It's in the back of the eye. And I basically placed an AC lens and actually left her dislocated lens in the eye. Um, I don't do that very often, but this was a situation that just to save surgical time and manipulation was appropriate. And she did fine after surgery and uh, enjoyed reading for another 18 months. So think about the patient. This is a different patient where I did place an AC lens. This is the dislocated posterior lens that's coming out of the eye. And I like to do a good pars planar vitrectomy with infusion and then uh, place the anterior chamber lens. Um, and I usually leave the haptics oriented horizontally. This was a lens I showed you earlier um, and this would be ideal for iris fixation. Uh, I don't do iris fixation very often and this patient was not very keen having already been through one lens exchange. And so for eyes like that, putting a large rigid 
lens in the ciliary sulcus. Usually these center up very nicely. Sometimes those foldable lenses with three pieces um, just don't fit the uh, fit a large sulcus very well. Um, so there's still a role for a larger incision. And here's a uh, pseudo exfoliation capsular bag dislocation, but but luckily it's got a capsule attention ring in. And these are always nice because you've got nice hardware. You don't have to rely on the lens haptics. You've got a you've got a ring to just refixate. This is another eye. You can't see the capsule attention ring because the pupil doesn't dilate. But but this one here's the video. Um, you know you can locate the capsule attention ring. This I did a few years ago, and I was using Nino Proline to do this, but suture refixation, uh, looping the capsule attention ring. Um, as you can see, I don't have scleral flaps. That's full thickness sclera. Do the same on the other side. And then um, tie these off um, under physiologic pressure to ensure centration. and. Um, and it's all been done through a small incision. So that's one reason why my threshold for placing capsule attention rings is actually, has actually gone down at the time of primary cataract surgery. Um, there are other lenses, as we've discussed, that, that have the potential to be suture fixated. The top one here is the Acrios lens, and the lower one here is actually meant for uh, endocapsule fixation. It's, uh, it's an Invista Bausch & Lomb lens but actually is fortunate to have a hole in it. Not all, not all lenses are ideal um, for, for refixation. And I've had variable success with three piece lenses. Um, but sometimes you get faced with an acreos like this that's dislocated. And it's, it's about the only time I'm happy to see an acreos in the eye because it's easy refixation through both the, both the foot plates on one side that's Gore-Tex CV8, again, through full thickness sclera. Refixate the other side as well. And um, again, all done through small incisions. So um, so that's uh, that's the advantage of an Acrios lens if it's already there. But as I mentioned earlier, the, these are hydrophilic lenses. And um, here's a hydrophilic lens I had to explant uh, because it, it developed opacification from, from a gas bubble um, so that's a risk, whether it's cornea surgery now or, or retina surgery. And this was a patient who um, presented like this. This is both eyes on the same day um, with dislocated lenses. And so these are, at least uh, this eye over here is a little bit beyond uh, simple suture refixation. So then I, my preference um, is to go ahead and do um, a sutured lens exchange. Here I'm actually using a, a blade to, to make the sclerotomy so I don't dislocate the lens as I force the trocar in. And then a pars planar a cannula to help levitate the lens, little vitrectomy, and then sweep the iris uh, to bring the lens anterior. Um, and then I remove the lens. And again, I actually place my Gore-Tex with a handshake technique uh, from inside to out. Is already looped through one eyelet of a CZ lens. Do the same thing on the other side. And the lens goes in uh, very nicely. Um, usually, I, not usually, always, I rotate the Gore-Tex knot into the eye and don't have, don't have trouble. And uh, this, this uh, sutures has a very low profile post-op. So um, it's actually very hard to see under the conjunctiva. Uh, but sometimes the lenses are, are hanging precariously. And so I do these with my colleagues, my retina colleagues, um, uh, with, a, with a more formal vitrectomy approach, but the same um, uh, scleral suture technique. Um, here's a patient I want to show you. She's 80 years old. She's 2400 after cataract surgery and comes to me with corneal edema and macular edema. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on in this eye. You can sort of see a haptic here and this looks like an optic there. Retro illumination, you realize, okay, this is a single piece acrylic lens that's dislocated, it's reversed, and the patient's got uh, significant problems with the cornea and macula. 
And I, I told this patient, I think we should just get this lens out and get your eye to settle down before we, we think about placing another lens. Um, my concern was the way this lens was hanging here, it was going to dislocate quickly, but it turned out I was able to explant it through a small incision, except that the trailing haptic here wouldn't come, it was stuck. And what I realized was um, this lens had actually been sutured in. So here's the suture placed and the surgeon who did it did a beautiful job because you can't see the suture up here. Um, but this, this is a type of lens that should never be sutured. Um, if it's in the bag and it's a bag dislocation, as, as Dr. Ahmed showed you, I, I think that's, that's fine to re-suture those, but these are not designed to be primarily sutured uh, in the sulcus like this. Um, I won't talk much about iris and sutureless um, since we've already kind of heard about these, but we've heard about iris fixation as an option. Uh, uh, this is not one of my cases. I, I don't tend to do these as I do see uh, patients with uveitis and in this setting and end up removing these lenses. Um, and then Yamane technique um, uh, with, the, with the flange, you can see nicely inferiorly here, but not so much superiorly. Um, I do less of these primarily because I'm working on the cornea a lot of the time and I'm dealing with views like this um, and they need combined uh, lens placement and desec surgery. But I've also seen cases of uh, haptic disinsertion. Here's the haptic and the dislocated optic and the same over here. And uh, I do like a CZ lens. I do like an eyelet lens because if they drop in the future, um, my retina colleagues can go in through three ports um, and uh, th uh, thread, the, thread the lens in the eye and suture it off without uh, needing to make a large incision. So it just minimizes what you need to do in the future. So um, prevention, prevention, prevention can can save you managing these in the future, but otherwise consider the cause, anatomy, type of lens, comorbidities, and the patient goals. And therefore individualize your approach based on the each eye uh, and patient. And as we, we talked about, you know, we, we talk about techniques a lot, but what are the what are the outcomes? And I'm somebody that really wants uh, to master a technique and really wants to get the best long-term results. And I, I would encourage you that um, there's lots of different ways to place these lenses. Get, get good at you know, a few techniques um, and do it well for the, for the long-term. Uh, th thanks for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patil. That was a very good talk and uh, excellent videos. And we have a lot of questions uh, coming up, but we'll take all those after the next uh, talk. So, I would like to invite Dr. Dhanashri Ratra, who's a senior consultant at our Vitro Retinal Department. And uh, uh, she is our go to person for all these uh, complicated uh, cataract. Uh, uh, VR backup surgeries and for any of the uh, SIs. Uh, she is a college of surgeons and uh, she has a lot of papers in peer reviewed international and national journals and chapters in various books. So uh, she's been doing a lot of uh, suture fixated and uh, sutureless as well. Gortex is, I think, her favorite. So, ma'am, over to you to uh, discuss your viewpoint and uh, sharing the vitro retinal surgeon's point of view for a dislocated eye. Uh, thank you, uh, Shivali, for this kind introduction, and thank you, Shikha and Shivali, for this uh, invitation. So, I would like to share my screen. Uh, yeah. So, I hope the screen is visible. No, ma'am, we are not able to see yet. Sorry. Um, so I see share screen. Share. Is it okay now? Yeah, it started. Yeah, it started. Uh, 
I'll just do the slide too. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And uh, we are running late, so I would try to be very brief. Uh, I have already edited the videos to a very short time of uh, just over a minute. And uh, luckily, most of the points are very beautifully covered already by Dr. Patel. So my job is uh, much easy. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about management of dislocated IOLs today. Uh, I have no financial uh, disclosures to uh, disclose. So it is not uncommon to see uh, IOLs in various uh, subluxated or displaced positions such as this, where the IOL is no longer in the central position and the haptic may be displaced from the normal position. And sometimes you may have in the back uh, subluxation or dislocation. And uh, very often you also encounter uh, uh, situations such as this where the IOA is completely dislocated into the vitreous cavity and lying on the retina. So uh, apart from the visual disturbances, there can be many complications of a dislocated IOA, including intraocular hemorrhage, retinal detachment, cystoid macular edema, glaucoma, and change in the vision along with the head movements, sometimes persistent inflammation and rarely infection. However, with the newer IOLs that we have, all these complications are much less. So uh, in the way of management, observation is a good option, especially as Dr. Patel just mentioned, if the patient is of a very advanced age, a, a, a patient has associated debilitating systemic diseases, or if it's a soft IOL, or if it is a fixed IOL, or if patient is not willing for surgery, then it can be very well be left and just observed further but it is better to monitor for any side threatening complications and sometimes medical legal issues might be there. So you may have to uh, take into account those uh, situations. Uh, sometimes uh, in situations uh, you can, you may have to remove the IOL and exchange it for another IOL. Uh, this is generally seen if the IOL which is dislocated is already damaged or broken, haptics are broken, or if you have a plate haptic, uh, or one-piece foldable IOLs, which uh, just now Dr. Patel mentioned that these are not good for uh, sulcus fixation. So these should be removed and exchanged for another uh, IOL. Or if you have some coexisting complex retinal detachments, then you need to remove them so that you can tackle the retinal detachment in a better way. However, most of the IOLs can be refixated uh, in the central uh, sulcus position. Uh, if you have uh, enough capsular support, then they can, it can be used to reposition the lens or in case of no capsular support, you may have to do a scleral fixation. So there are two approaches, either an external approach can be used or an internal approach. Uh, in, in external approach, uh, uh, basically it involves either you can have sutures or sutureless uh, method of fixation. It basically involves exteriorizing the complete IOL or just part of the haptic. And the haptic can be either then sutured to the sclera or it can be tucked into pockets uh, similar to Agarwal method or even uh, Yamane method, etc. But I am going to talk to you about the internal uh, methods of fixation. Uh, this is what I prefer. And I do not exteriorize the IOL or any part of the IOL. And uh, maneuvers are done internally to fixate the IOL internally. So this is one technique called lasso technique, uh, which was described first by Lawrence et al. in the 1990s. And here you can see that the IOL is dislocated. Uh, after the conjunctival opening, I make a scleral uh, cut uh, after marking the 180 degrees apart. And here I'm using a crescent knife to create some two pockets. So this is what I mean by making scleral pockets. You need not make complete flaps, but can just make pockets. So chandelier is fixed because this is a bimanual surgery. And here you do a complete vitrectomy is done, taking care of doing complete base excision, etc. Now a 10 proline needle uh, is docked into a hollow needle on the opposite side under the scleral pockets and the, th the thread is uh, pulled out from the one of the sclerotomies. So this thread is then cut and fashioned into two lasso loops. So the idea is that when you pull one thread, the lasso gets uh, tightened and it can act as a noose which can be fixed around the haptic. So this another uh, second knot is to uh, fix the lasso loop, otherwise it can come undone during our surgery. And here this with uh, using two intraocular forceps, the lasso is taken inside. The, the haptics are passed through the lasso loop and the, the loop is tightened around the maximum curvature of the haptic. Similar thing is done on the other side and the, you, uh, the knot is positioned at the maximum curvature of the haptic. So then you pull the sutures from outside the, the sclera and the IOL can be very beautifully placed back in place. 
and these sutures are then fixed onto the sclera under the scleral flaps or a scleral bed however this is a two point fixation and we already heard that two point fixation is not a very desirable situation and there are chances that there can be a phacodonesis so uh, 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 four point fixation is better and also the gortex suture is uh, better than uh, tenoproline because tenoproline can get uh, biodegraded after a few years so this is a situation where i have used the gortex uh, uh, for a lasso and this is a patient with coloboma so the lens has been dislocated inside and this is a gortex cv8 suture uh, so you take one, the suture and fashion the lasso loop on one end and this is a very thick suture and quite pliable so it's quite easy to make the lasso uh, but it is a little difficult to tighten the pull the thread and tighten the lasso inside the vitreous cavity so here i am taking the lasso loop inside and the haptic is passed through the lasso loop and then with a bimanual approach with two forceps it is tightened around the haptic and similarly second thing uh, second haptic is also lassoed but here i am going through the anterior chamber and using a thicker forceps uh, to pull the suture so once the two both the haptics are tied then you can tighten tie the suture onto the sclera and fix it so this is a four point fixation where uh, just take a piece of gortex suture and make one just simple knot in the middle of the suture uh, you do not do not even require a lasso and here again the haptic is passed through the knot and the knots are just uh, the threads are pulled to tighten the knot and the second thread is then taken out through the sclerotomy so here i have made a scleral pocket and then two 23 gauge sclerotomies uh, one 2 mm apart uh, from the central point so this similar thing is done on the other side so the haptic is uh, kept onto the iris for support and then you you hold the intraocular forceps the hold the haptic pass it through the knot tighten the knot and just take the other uh, thread out of the sclerotomy and this is then tied under the flap with a 3 to 1 fashion so i always like to use the flaps because that gives a good cover the gortex actually lies quite flat onto the sclera and does not cause any cosmetic or any other problem so this is a another similar situation but here here i have used a cow hitch knot instead of the simple knot uh, just as a different variation but i think it is a little bit more uh, secure so if first you do vitrectomy complete vitrectomy the two 180 degree points are marked here i have done scleral flaps and then two sclerotomies are done with 23 gauge uh, trocar i do not use the cannula just right only the trocar and then two paracentesis sites are done so the lens is picked up and i uh, uh, put it into the anterior chamber over the iris uh, luckily this is a three piece lens so it is uh, possible to fixate this now this is a piece of the cv8 gortex suture uh, you pa make it into a loop uh, just uh, and then pass it under the haptic and pull the threads through the loop to have a cow hitch type of a knot around the haptic and this is a very secure it uh, catches the haptic very securely securely and similar thing is done on the other side and uh, so this is you just pull the sutures through the loop and tighten the knot so then uh, under the flap you go through the sclerotomy with the forceps and just pull those threads outside the sclerotomy so this is uh, both the threads and the similar thing is done on the other side uh, is very easy if you go partly through the anterior chamber and feed those uh, threads into the other uh, inside intraocular forceps the haptic is placed un under the iris uh, and uh, once the have both the haptics are in place then you can tight pull on both the sutures on both the sides simultaneously you can pull both the sides to give you a good traction on the iol you can see the iol is very well centered and it is very well uh, stable then you just tie the sutures with a 4 uh, 3 to 1 technique and uh, these flaps can be either glued or sutured uh, it is left to you the conjunctiva can be glued or sutured so sometimes you may have in the back dislocation uh, and this is one such a situation where the entire uh, lens and the bag is dislocated sometimes you may, you may also have the ctr along with this and uh, as dr aik uh, showed similar technique is done but here this is done in the vitreous cavity so go through the under the scleral flap with a tenoproline needle just pass it through the capsular remnants under the haptic 
uh, taking care that you are passing it under the maximum curvature and then pass it back and uh, just uh, tighten it on the scleral side so here again another side same thing is done so this you take care of uh, maintaining a distance between the two uh, suture bites and also make sure that they are 180 degree apart so as so that you do not have any tilt now here i did not try to remove the sombering rings because frankly it is very difficult to dissect that and it is actually not needed because it gives more stability to the lens and it is easier for you to put the sutures through that so uh, there sometimes uh, when you have when you have your old patients which uh, operated 10 years 15 years ago they may come with a dislocated uh, scleral fixated iol and we are using this uh, scleral fixated iol from the oro lab which has got two eyelets on the haptics and uh, if the suture gets degraded this can fall into the vitreous cavity but uh, nothing to worry this is also very easy to refix and here i am using the gortex suture which is tied onto the proline tenoproline so just tie the both the sutures together and use the tenoproline needle to guide you through the uh, eyelet of the haptic now this is required because the gortex is very pliable and it is difficult to thread it through this uh, haptic uh, uh, hole especially inside the vitreous cavity outside the eye it can be done easily but inside it is difficult so when you pull the proline suture through the hap haptic eyelet the gortex can get pulled and then just uh, retrieve it back cut the uh, proline and then retrieve the suture back and you can tie tie the suture under the flap and similar thing can be done on the other side so this is uh, pretty uh, easy to refix if you have a good enough capsular rim like about 2 to 3 mm of capsular rim is enough to fixate the depot uh, reposition the iol here you can see there is a good enough capsular rim and luckily this dislocated iol is a rigid one piece large iol so this can fit very well onto the capsular rim so uh, of course what to do with this uh, uh, lens depends on the what type of lens is there and what type of capsular support you have so here the lens is uh, maneuvered into the anterior chamber and then just dialed into the sulcus and it remains quite stable on the residual capsular rim so this can be achieved uh, very well without exteriorizing the lens uh, or without any sutures so air is just used to give mo more stability to the iol in the immediate post operative period and there are certain situations where the iol has to be removed and uh, uh, scleral fixated iol has needs to be done so i now uh, exclusively use the gortex for a four point fixation now this is a 11 year old girl with trauma you can see the corneal sutures the large traumatic midriasis and uh, acrios lens which is dislocated into the eye and you can see the macular some scarring also so i did not want to fixate this lens because uh, i was not very sure about this uh, lens in the sulcus and plus it's an 11 year old child so i did not want to take the risk of using this lens in the sulcus so i am using a orolab uh, scleral uh, sf iol with an eyelet and with a gortex four point fixation is being done so i do not use the needles of the gortex i just simply use a thread and i do not even use the cannula i go directly to through the sclerotomy so so this gives this is a very large lens and it gets beautifully centered so almost any situation the lens can be salvaged and it can be repositioned and refixed into position uh, here this eye has already scar on one side and corneal edema with a dislocated lens but uh, with uh, uh, lasso procedure it is now beautifully uh, fixated uh, complications can occur with this maneuver such as intraocular hemorrhage retinal injury or retinal break iol can get damaged and it is always good to have a backup iol with you with a dpr done so that in case the iol gets damaged you are ready to do uh, exchange the iol and fix another one a uh, redislocation is common especially with proline sutures but uh, hopefully with gortex the dislocation rate would be less retinal detachment can occur if you are not very careful during your maneuvers uh, glaucoma can occur and very rarely optic atrophy or macular uh, edema can occur however to conclude i would say that refixation of a dislocated iol is a fairly uh, safe procedure and using various uh, techniques almost any iol can be repositioned uh, concomitant problems can be tackled simultaneously such as retinal detachment or uh, membranes etc but however it's a demanding surgery and it requires dexterity and biomanual maneuverability uh, i would like to acknowledge the help of so many people for this presentation and thank you so much for your patient listening
thank you ma'am that was an excellent uh, talk uh, in fact uh, both the talks were uh, great with some elegant video presentations uh, with that uh, we'll move to the uh, panel discussion of the last uh, session yeah can we have the uh, slides for the audience question yeah so the uh, first question uh, uh, is uh, from dr shweta she wants to know uh, which is the uh, Uh, the technique for scleral fixate uh, fixation of lenses for the anterior segment surgeons. So probably we can start with Dr. Patel. What's his uh, view? What do you think as an anterior segment surgeon? Which technique? We've seen so many techniques. Which technique is uh, should an anterior segment surgeon? As Dr. Elzi uh, has already pointed out that the anterior segment surgeons might not do. Uh, Uh, that great a justice to vitrectomy as a VR surgeon does. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think there's there's multiple techniques, and I think the the best technique is the technique that you are best at. Um, so, you know, choose something that works in your hands. No, uh, um, if somebody is to start with the procedure, somebody is in training. In fact, we've had a question from the audience. They want to know, you know. Uh, which are the places where the person can get trained? There are places where you can get trained to do cataract surgeries, but there there aren't that many places where you know you can get trained to do uh, secondary IOLs. This is something you begin uh, when you are faced with this kind of problem. So, if somebody is to, if an anterior segment surgeon wants to, you know, start begin with, so which technique uh, should uh, one recommend? Them? Well, I, again, I think it de it depends on it depends on the eye and depends on the patient. I mean, I think I think we should all know some suture fixation techniques. We should all be able to do some iris fixation techniques. Um, it I I don't know that there's a technique that you can start with and then gradually evolve. But um, you, you know it. It does require a skill set, as we as we just heard, to use. You know, you got to be able to use both hands, understand the anatomy, um, and then individualize it. I, I'm sorry if that doesn't answer the question. No, no, it does. It does. It's a perspective. So let me, let me that's what we want. I think. Let Let me put it in. Who is your teacher? Who is supervising you? I think generally that's the way all of us have preferences because the way you are trained are the way that the center where you are working at. I think that's maybe probably I can put it. Yeah, I, I think that kind of answers it. Uh, yeah, one of the questions on the chats on Facebook and YouTube is from where where can we get Gore-Tex? What is the source of uh, getting it? It's a suture that's used in cardiac surgeries very commonly. So, uh, what are the sources of uh, Gore-Tex for uh, for the surgeons who uh, propound its uh, use? I think it is easily available because particularly if you are known friend or cardiac surgeon or multi specialty hospital you just ask for uh, con uh, contact yeah. detail vendors detail and I think you can get it. Yeah go, go to your um general surgery area and sneak inside the suture room and grab the sutures from the cardiac tray. That doesn't yeah, go go medical go gore, gore medical gore medical is the manufacturer so I will caution that uh, they have, uh, you know, on their on their labeling on their boxes is not for ophthalmic use. You know, they wanted to protect themselves liability wise. So, you may want to get a consent from the patient to understand the purposes. And I think the standard of care. I think you'd have most people would back you up if there was an issue legally speaking to use it in the eye. I think that so there is an issue with uh, fibrin glue. I mean, all these things are not for the ophthalmology, but. Uh, in India, I guess we don't have so much of a uh, concern, whereas uh, abroad we do have to take these things into consideration. Even for a small pterygium surgery, to use a glue, uh, you know, you have to explain to the patient that it's off the label use. Uh, but yeah, we are lucky out here in India, and we are uh, doing many of these things quite freely, I guess. So another question in the chat is. Uh... How easy or difficult is it to explant an iris claw lens, uh, which has uh, partially uh, got uh, it's uh, it's dislocated partially? That is, one side has come out. 
So you just go I, and tap I, it in again. That is the I mean, I mean, I would try. I would try to refixate it if there was no issue with the lens while it was fixated. Of course, if you need to do more surgery or you're doing a you know endothelial keratoplasty, then depending on the surgeon, one may decide to explant it. But otherwise, I would try to refixate it. But you have to ask yourself, why did it happen? Was it because of damage to the haptic itself? Sometimes they get bent when, during enclavation. Or was it because of the tissue? The iris tissue is atrophied or very thin and not able to hold it. If it's an issue with the uh, haptic, one can typically suture the haptic. We published a small case report on that with some suture, proline suture to suture the haptic actually to the, to the, to the iris. If it's an iris issue, then you may want to move the lens somewhere and refixate both. But to de-enclavate uh, iris call lens is like super easy. Just take, just grab the lens with a micro forcep and take a Sinsky hook if it's anteriorly and push down on the iris where it's enclavated and it'll just slip through the, um, the, the iris claw. That's also one of the downsides. That's one reason why I will say you see dislocations uh, in the long run sometimes. Thank you, that was really helpful. Any other comments from uh, the panel? Dr. Kiranji, are you there? Are you there with us? Another question uh, just now uh, that came up on the chat is from Dr. Prashant Bhatia from Dubai. He uh, wants to, it's again, uh, the question is to Dr. Kiranji and Dr. Aikamar that uh, the mechanical opening of the angle, will it have any role in the pro prolonged ITC, that is the ivido trabecular uh, contact? Dr. Prashant wants to know that. Uh, Dr. Kiranji had spoken about uh, mechanically pulling the uh, iris with uh, uh, with the uh, new lens that he's coming up with. Uh, so he wants to know whether it will have any effect on the prolonged ITC. Yeah, well, hey, Prashant, nice, nice to nice to hear you from uh, from far away um, in 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 uh, UAE. But so I think uh, I think that yeah, I mean theoretically, yes. I mean if you have the iris on some tension, it may help. The tension is not necessarily. Um, you know, uh, centripetal in nature. So I don't know if it would be sufficient to actually, um, you know, cause a change in the effective filtration area of the angle of the TM. However, I think it does a good job of keeping the iris away from the angle if you're worried about aerodotrabecular contact. Um, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it, it, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I would do that primarily, to be honest, just for that purpose. Uh, I haven't, it'll be interesting to see what um, Karanjit Singh feels about those things. But I find if you have a very floppy iris and you're worried about re synechia after you've released the synechia from an angle closure, I typically suture the iris. I do a cerclage technique to put the tension on the iris and that keeps it away from the angle, like a pupiloplasty. And also if you put enough tension on it, you get a pilocarpian-like effect in some ways, pulling on the spur and increasing the filtration area of the angle that theoretically may help with the uh, pressure lowering from a TM level. So that's what I would say about glaucoma. Thanks for asking about glaucoma though. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kiranji. I think it's uh, it not happening. Yeah, he's taking a break for dinner probably. Uh, so uh, the uh, next question uh, here is, uh, would you like to share the screen again, uh, Dr. Srivadi? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, this is from Dr. Ajita, who wants to know that if you're working in the semi-urban setup and uh, there uh, you don't have probably that much of a backup. So uh, which technique of secondary IOL should one, uh, you know, uh, prefer? So I think it's again kind of coming back to the same thing. Uh, this time, I think uh, I can only answer that whatever you're comfortable with, that is what the panel feels. So with that, we'll move to the next question. And that is, in case of traumatic cataract, self-sealed corneal wound secondary to penetrating trauma with soft cataract with ruptured anterior capsule, no uveitis, no uh, patient is on topical antibiotics and steroids. The scan is normal. When is it? preferable to operate the patient for cataract. This is not exactly about secondary IOL, but still we put the question, probably uh, the, uh, or, uh, Dr. Praveen wants to know when is the best time to do the surgery uh, in traumatic cataract when the capsule is open. And so uh, I, 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 could be weak. 
as early as possible. My feeling is, I mean, yeah, you don't want to wait months, but I, I think I find some people rush in so fast unnecessarily. And sometimes you want the eye to be settled down, treat them with some steroids. Um, if their pressure is not high, you have some time. Uh, you have some time, you know, within a week or two to, to go and do surgery when things are a bit settled down. The downside of going in too early is, of course, the eye may be still inflamed. There may be other issues going on anatomically. So I would prefer to wait. Of course, if you have, you know, uh, corneal issues or glaucoma issues, you're forced to go in early. But I often wait. Now, if you wait too long, uh, well, if you, if you wait enough, then the capsule is a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit fibrose. It may help you a little bit to prevent the capsule from tearing out. And the lens softens up a bit from hydration a bit. So it makes it easier to remove. If you wait too long, you get posterior synechia which can be hard to remove. So I find that I think within a week or two is fine if you can afford to wait. Yeah, maybe, Any other yeah. comments? Yeah, partly I agree. But the only thing is if you have a loose cortex floating, then you don't have a choice. You can't wait, probably. But otherwise, uh, what Dr. Aiki says, I think I agree with him. Dr. Patel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with Ike. I mean, um, even if there's loose cortex floating, as long as, um, you know, there's not a profoundly inflamed eye and the pressure's good, waiting, I, I will wait sometimes three to four weeks. Uh, and again, for that capsule of fibrosis, because then get getting the, the soft cortex out is easy and you may actually still be able to get a, get a lens in the bag um because there's sufficient you know fibrosis and capsule support for that so going in too early you might find that you disrupt the capsule more than you needed to lg sir i think it's it's uh, everybody is kind of agreeing to yeah i think it's been answered it is Fine. so uh, with that we'll go to the next set of questions which is mostly about the pediatric uh, patients secondary iols in pediatric patients uh, uh, what is your technique uh, of choice in children and uh, the age part of it i think it's already been addressed uh, uh, dr yamane uh, uh, talk in that uh, session we've already discussed it and uh, yeah, we'll have the comments from uh, Dr. Sumita. What is the, uh, how uh, different it is? What is your uh, approach to managing uh, apachia in children? No, you're muted. You're muted. I think it depends on whether you're, it's a unilateral or a bilateral cataract. Unilateral cataract, probably you will go in a little early in the sense the age of the child, as long as uh, it is as early, you can get a good uh, biometry and uh, you can get pressures and things like that. But older children, probably it's worthwhile to wait for a little longer to get a more reliable um, biometry. Uh, that comes to the age. Then if, if you... Most of the, with the newer lenses, most of the lens, children are, if the eye is of normal size, anatomically there is no, most of them are likely to get a primary IOL implantation only. So secondary IOL are probably in the sense where there is a zonular, primary zonular disease, or if there is a trauma. I don't see. And if they are bad candidates for primary IOL implantation, then they are bad candidates for secondary IOL implantation too, in the sense of uh, having a very small eye or a microcornea. Uh, Dr. Kiranjit's video showed, but he was probably using a customized lens and which I would not put in a very, very small eye, uh, iris fixated eye, even if I have a very, very customized lens available. Now, because are small IOs available, ma'am? I mean, uh, or yeah. are custom made? There are, there are. I think in India, IO care produces customized IOL. If you want, you can get it. But it's not just the IOL, it's the IOL power also. You will have a lens which requires 35 plus 35 in a very small. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, conservative about uh, putting I, IOL, whether it's primary or secondary, in an in a anatomically very small eye. Which technique do you? Which technique? Because only if there is a posterior capsular support. 
so for me the technique is simple i use a three piece i will try to open up the bag aspirate the submarine ring or take it out as far as possible if i do have a if i am able to open up the bag you put it in the bag single piece or three piece i will or a three piece i will with a little bit of uh, occasionally i do pupillary capture but uh, dislocation in a three piece i will in surface is definitely an issue and you have to sometimes go and refixate it back Uh, especially in period disintegration is very um, as the children grow older because corneas become bigger and sometimes you can have disintegration so that's okay. any other comments from the panel nano of thermic ice in the previous cataract update which was dealt in detail nano of thermos in children is uh, I'm just saying that anatomically, uh, eyes which are not uh, uh, as developed or uh, different, so then doing procedures in this is definitely uh, not an easy thing. Nanothalmos is a separate clinical entity. It's not just a small eye. Okay, it has other other major issues going on with it, and you cannot treat it like just a small eye. It's not whether in children or in adults. It is a different entity altogether. Uh, yeah, That's why we had a whole update dedicated to that. Yes, That's true. Right. I'm just informing the audience so that they can have a look at that as well. Sure. So, any other uh, uh, any other comments from the panel regarding the technique of surgery for pediatric patients for pediatric age group? They all agree with only uh, sulcus placement or any other thing has been attempted by uh, the panel or any other any of the faculty for pediatric patients. of european data on artisan iuls but we unfortunately cost is a big factor in india and it's not that easily available but probably artisan lenses are also an option in children specifically in children and there is lot of promise in iris claw lenses retrofixated because that keeps them away from the cornea again major problem is no long term data on retrofixated iris but that is something which is promising and i actually want to look at it as a possible So just to make a couple of comments I mean this is this is a big area to discuss we have a lot of different ways we've managed these cases um and I think we're speaking about obviously there's no question of putting an eye well in the bag is preferable right I mean we don't we don't doubt this when you're going to put a lens in the eye if you are and doing a posterior cap I like to do a posterior capsular excess and use a posterior optic buttonhole technique now we have seen studies comparing contact lens for AFK versus IOLs I think you've seen those studies and if a patient can and a family and a baby can use contact lens this is the preferred approach i think because the eye is changing and evolving and you can you know keep up with that so this is the preferred approach i will say even though i'm i'm not a contact lens guy i'm a i'm a surgeon but i think this is the first approach there are situations however where for a variety of reasons we cannot do this and so in those situations where again there is uh you know a uh, lack of capsule support and i cannot put a lens in the sulcus or optic capture then my go to technique is now to use again spiral fixated lenses um and the amani technique is what i've been currently using as young as 2 years of age the artisan lens yes we have clinical trials going on right now uh to look at the artisan lens there's been some literature on this so we'll see where that goes i do caution artisan lenses in general because you know they ha- they have a tendency to dislocate and when they dislocate in kids uh they may they may not know they're dislocated for some period of time um with trauma or whatever else may happen and this is one of the downsides honestly with the artisan or the iris claw lens as much as i like it is that they can dislocate with trauma or, or repetitive trauma or iris changes over time so that's one caution i i do think that there's no perfect option and you do what you feel is best but in our experience um cautiously if i had to put a lens in secondarily in a pediatric patient again assuming we have sclera no- normal assuming we don't have any weird anomalous uh you know anatomy or, or architectural then uh i i think a uh, a mono technique is is reasonable and then as they get older uh what we have done in some cases is actually put an artisan lens as a piggyback just as karanjit showed um or honestly to remove a mono lens is not so difficult i'll be honest with you i've had some experiences both in adults and kids and that can be done as well so those are just again I, we could go on and on talking about this but those are just my quick um anecdotal but yet we need more evidence comments what's the longest follow up of uh, doing these lenses yamane lenses in children 
For your money specifically, I probably would say it's, it's relatively shorter term. Uh, in the last five years or so, I would say, maybe four years. Um, we have art, artisans longer than that. And before that, though, I was doing uh, Gore-Tex scleral suture fixation uh, of an IOL, typically, for example, a CZ70BD uh, after the age of two. Um, that's typically what we have. And for those, we have some, you know, probably we have uh, 10, years, 10 years in some cases uh, of experience. Yeah. I will ask you one question here. How much of vitrectomy will you do? I mean, is it okay for a pediatric ophthalmologist or anterior segment surgeon to do a uh, Yamanis technique in a child with a very formed vitreous where PVD is difficult to induce? I mean, you have uh, to manage the vitreous 100%. I mean, I suggest, I suggest, uh, you know, I mean, we all do. I mean, I, 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 I admit I'm in the vitreous every week, pars plana. But in those cases, I think it's really incumbent to have a VR surgeon specialized in this area to, uh, to do a com combination technique, uh, much as Dr. Patel mentioned, you know, to combine retina and enter segment. I would, I would suggest in these young patients, because you really have to be careful, as you said, managing um, vitreous, which is different than managing an older patient. I'm very comfortable managing an older patient, honestly, with a PVD yeah. uh, and less form vitreous. And Jesus comments so. on pleural fixated IOS for children. I haven't done anything at a two years age and all that. Your youngest child where I put a CZBD lens is maybe around uh, eight years or nine years age. Not uh, not earlier than that. So earlier than that, I think I have no experience. Sutured pleural fixated. Sutured, but Yamane, I have not had an opportunity to put it in a young child as yet. And I started using MNA only for the last maybe two years. So I cannot say that I have a huge experience. So I'm not done it on a on children now. Can MNA technique be used uh, to put it in uh, patients who have a poor sulcus fixation? They have, say, 180 degrees and not there imperially. Can the same technique be used to put a lens in sulcus? Will it be more stable than a than putting a lens into the sulcus where there is a deficient uh, capsular support or ductility. Can, can the same technique be used? I, I, I didn't get, get your question. You mean you should, can you use Yamane technique even with the capsule in place? Yes, say you have a cap, you have a capsular support, but not fully. Or why, why, why do you need to do a Yamane then? You might as well put it in the in front of the capsule and maybe add add an extra suture if you wish to, to keep it in place uh, rather than doing a MRI technique. You don't have to exteriorize the haptic. But if you're exteriorizing the haptic, there's a capsule there or not, it doesn't matter. It's stay quite well. Except that if you want to keep it in front of the posterior capsule, residual capsule, and you have to exteriorize it, I'm not sure how uh, accurate you're going to be when the needle is passed. I'm talking with in, sometimes in traumatic patients that you can see a part of the capsular rim is there, but will it be more stable to put it that way? Yes. I guess it, it can, but I'm not sure uh, how accurate you can be with respect to the deficient area of the capsule versus the anchorage of the haptic. But I'm sure it should be very easy to introduce the haptic into the needle as long as you can bring the needle out at the correct location, which is in front of the posterior capsule and not behind. Because when, when we are you have no capsular support at all. You are not worried about where the needle is exiting. It's about two millimeters from the limbus is where I usually put the needle in. But that point may not exactly be in front of your residual posterior capsule. So if you can bring the needle in right in front of the posterior capsule, you can easily thread the haptic into that and bring it out. That's not, that's not very difficult. Thank you. I think Gopal mentions some good points. You have to be careful with the uh, where your needle will enter the eye from. And very often, the landmarks we use, you're going to be behind the capsule. For sure, you'll be behind the capsule. So I don't know what the val if it's valuable as much, but you make a good point. We often assume the sulcus is no problem. The sulcus capsule, put a lens in there. I have seen more than enough of lens decentration or lens tilt or you know chafing that can happen. So it's not a slam dunk, as we say here. Um, you, it has to be the proper sizing and everything. So sometimes we get away with it, but... You know, I really prefer if we can to make an opening in the in the capsule and optic capture it, even if it's the post capsule, we can open it and put it behind the optic. So 
Um, that's really what we prefer. And if not, then I agree with Gopal. I would just throw a suture around it, simple. If I had to do more fixation and use both capsule and the suture to secure the lens. I think very often in the children, the, the capsule, the iris, everything gets very much scarred and adherent. And it would be very difficult to dissect this to get some correct tissue planes for you to place the lens in the sulcus. I think this would be to do a scleral fixation IOL in such patients and not to bother with any dissection with the uh, you know, iris and the residual capsule, etc. Dr. GSR wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I just wanted a caution against exteriorizing the haptic on one side and supporting the haptic on the residual capsule on one side. If you exercise, you exercise on both sides. If you support it on the capsule, do it on when it's complete. Do not do the hybrid technique. Sure. Hi. What so, about Dr. Patel, uh, you have experience in children. So most most of the lenses in children, my my colleague uh, Eric Bothan does. Uh, and he's part of the, the trial for artisan lenses uh, as a secondary lens for children. But, you know, when they don't have a good chamber depth, then we do scleral fixate them. And so then he and I work together and we, we suture fixate them. I haven't done any Yamane in, in children. Uh, but as young as, um, in one case, eight, 18 months uh, from failing to, you know, wear a, wear a contact lens for amblyopia management. Uh, particularly coming back what Dr. Dhanishri says, but if you have a too much of fibrosis and you think manipulation is too difficult and, and then it can be extremely traumatic, I, I would prefer I, what Dr. Ahmed already said. I think you can manage with the contact lenses. That's the best approach, least traumatic, and probably functional outcome would be as same as, I mean, the best possible surgical technique. As long as you can pull on with the contact lenses, I think, and, and new contact lenses are exceptionally good. And we are using, like I do a lot of ROP babies and have fortunately Dr. Sumita with us helping us out because even that those premature babies, few months old babies, we are managing with uh, even contact lenses very well nowadays. I yeah, for sure, for, for sure. In these in these aphakic patients, go contact lens for sure. I, I, I would really push that because I think that is the safest and also you can, you know, continue to change as the patient gets older and then do it later on if you can. For primary, like for a, for a cataract surgery primarily, I know we debate what to do. Um, and I use an IOL for different reasons, uh, you know, managing vitreous, keeping it back and everything else. But uh, you can use the contact lens after an IOL as well. But for, for aphakia in a patient who's already had their lensectomy, really, I would really agree with contact lens as the first choice. Even uh, again, coming back a little bit, uh, deviating pediatric retinal detachment surgeries. And when we look at analyze our data, the one of the cause, commonest reason, I mean, cause for a detachment etiology we talk about is bad lid and cataract surgery in a pediatric age group. So I think you have to be extremely careful when you deal with uh, pediatric cataracts. Basically, vitreous and children, that needs to be dealt with properly. No, no, no. Uh, data which is done by us does not show that much of retinal detachment. 5.5% <laughs> 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 like at the end of 10 years, it's fine. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Indeed. Uh, children have a uh, you know tendency to develop a lot of uveitis and scarring after surgery. So even if the initial surgery is done well and the initial post-op it looks very good and very nice, but such children will often come after a few years with a very badly disfigured anterior anterior segment with the lens adherent everywhere, and it becomes very difficult to manage the lens in such a situation. So. I think it would be uh, best to assess the child and maybe not leave the child affecting. That would be a better option than to, you know, do some heroic surgery and try to somehow or the other try to fix the lens. That is what is the mentality that should be avoided. So maybe good to leave the child affecting for a few years, uh, rehabilitate with lens and then try to do a secondary IOL in a more controlled fashion. That would be better. And my That's answer, absolutely, yes, absolutely true. I, but putting the IOL is actually an anatomical decision. It's not really a, nothing to do with age, honestly. If you have normal sized eye, normal sized bag, and 
probably uh, willingness to follow up because that's very very important. Then only you should put IOL. If the patient is not going to come to me for follow up, I'm not going to put an IOL in a six month old baby. Definitely. Yeah, just want to ask one thing, Ashika. Uh, in uh, uh, kids needing corneal surgeries like PK, DSEC, and uh, also have uh, FAKIA, uh, which would be the better way to do? Uh, combining it with uh, uh, lens implantation, be it SFIOL or something, where uh, uh, the IOL calculation, everything could be challenging, or stage it later. Dr. Patel? Yeah. By uh, by stage it later, do you, do you mean do the cornea, cornea first cornea and, then, first and then the lens? And then, yeah. Or either, otherwise. Yeah, I mean, by, by doing the cornea first, it's... it's is, you know, cornea transplant in a child is difficult, you know, in the best of situations when they're, when they're already a fake, it's just going to get harder yet. Um, I, I mean, I, I can say I, I have very infrequently encountered this situation, but I think my, my feeling would be to have, have a lens present just to help with um, stability to, uh, go on and do a DSAC afterwards uh, to help manage the bubble. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to manage a bubble in a child, in an aphakic eye. Um, I think that's a challenge by itself. I, I would probably worry less about the refractive outcome um, and just think more about how I'm actually going to, you know, rehabilitate the corneal structures and, um, uh, you know, and if the if the patient needs a contact lens, ultimately that's that's fine. I think contact lens is, uh, by consensus, I think everybody is coming to contact lens in the pediatric management of the fake here. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Patel. No, that's okay. Sorry. So with that, I think we'll move to the uh, next part of the uh, session, that is uh, about the video submissions. We have had a great response. Uh, with video submissions and Dr. Srivalli will tell us more about it. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sika. So, uh, about the corneal transplant, uh, this was just uh, what we had uh, picked up on the literature search and this was a team from uh, USA which had these two good videos uh, showing about uh, with uh, PK and with an uh, ultra-thin DSEC. So uh, again, because we have got Dr. Sanjay Patil and Dr. Nivedita would want their comments on uh, when you're doing a combined surgery with an SFIOL, any deviation from the usual is, uh, would you do? Like before you do the open sky, before you take out the cornea, would you want the uh, scleral uh, trocars uh, to be put? Or is it that you would prefer to do it once it's, uh, the corneal graft has been removed? I uh, can I uh, answer now? Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, when I combine PK with uh, SFIOL, as I, I have already mentioned, I do Hoffman pocket technique. So it is the pocket which I make first when the eye is still unopened. And once I uh, make the partial trifin, I make a 180 degree entry into the uh, cornea, and without removing the cornea. I try and fixate the lens. Um, I take the initial throw and anchor it uh, partially, but final tightening I do only after the graft is sutured and uh, AC is well formed. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. When, when I do an open sky PK sutured lens, I, again, I use my usual technique for the sutured lens, uh, full thickness sclera, um, but place place the lens open sky and then um, uh, suture the PK into place, get the eye to a physiologic pressure before tying the lens off. For, for DSEC, um, when, I, when I combine these, I mean, I, I complete pretty much the entire lens portion first, in, including closing the conjunctiva uh, over the over the transcleral sutures and um, and that's just to try and help to start sealing the sclerotomies. Otherwise, 
uh, to do the desec becomes a challenge because you can't pressurize the eye. Um, so I try to get those to seal, um, but you also have to expect um, a higher dislocation rate in, in those kind of eyes because again they're they've been vitrectomized and they've got they've got holes everywhere. Thank you, thank you both of you, and uh, so we'll move on to the video submissions which we have got. And uh, we have done requested the registered members to also give some video submissions, and we had uh, almost around 35 videos, out of which 30 videos were pertaining to the topic. And we thank uh, our team of uh, judges, uh, Dr. Dhanashri, uh, Dr. Chetan Rao, and Dr. Nivedita, who have taken their time and gone through each of these 30 videos. And uh, we have the winner for the best video with us. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar. And uh, uh, so, the hand is, uh, yeah. And so the thing about a virtual meeting is that we are not getting this cup in uh, actually. So please bear with us. And uh, we are going to play that video and we invite Dr. Ravi Kumar to uh, uh, talk along with his video. This video, this is the abstract and says that it demonstrates the management of an iris dialysis with aphakia. Over to you, Dr. Ravi Kumar. Can I share my screen? Uh, you are playing. Yes. Yeah. This is actually, uh, this is a patient 60 years old. It's not playing. Can I share my screen? Yeah, it's playing. So, he had a cataract surgery. So, when we found, when we have looked into it, he yeah. had a large iris dialysis of about eight clock hours, and uh, there was uh, no evidence of any PT support. So we had uh, challenges of uh, two: one is managing the iris dialysis and uh, and managing the aphakia. So iris dialysis we managed with our own innovation technique called modified sewing machine technique, in which we have threaded the retrograde tensile proline into the 30 gauge uh, septoject dental needle. And then we made the suture loop on the opposite side of the dialysis. And the free end of the suture is passed through the loops and then tied to the other free end so that only one knot is sufficient and buried into the partial thickness spiral tunnel, which is made along with the iris dialysis. And then we shifted 90 degrees to the uh, other side. This is how you can see uh, the needle is partially withdrawn and again it is passed through the peripheral root of the iris from inside out to the pre-placed partial thickness clearance tunnel. And once the sufficient suture loops are made to anchor the uh, dialysis uh, iris, the free end of the first suture is passed through the loops, just like the sewing machine makes the knots. That is why we uh, named it as a modified sewing machine technique. Initially, we made the loops and cut the loops and then tied uh, each loop as one knot. But now this is the modification which we made which will be sufficient of only one knot for the entire dialysis. And once the dialysis is repair is done, then we shift it to the, uh, we anchor the retropupillary fixation of uh, iris, fixate, iris claw IOL to the 90 degrees to the other side. So that the dialysis, the repair dialysis part is not disturbed. And why we choose this uh, as is because this is managed in a peripheral rural secondary level eye care center. And uh, we didn't have the backup or the expertise for the glued SFIOL. And this is uh, comes as a more economical uh, way of managing as a secondary uh, IOL. And uh, it gave uh, reasonably good results. And so, more at one, uh, one go, like I did that, this is repaired, and then the second time I will go. This is published in the Legion of Ophthalmology, and recently it is also published, this technique is also published in uh, Mastering Iris uh, uh, and Pupil, uh, pupil uh, Techniques by Dr. Amar Agarwal. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Kumar, and uh, I would uh, like to have the judges' uh, uh, opinion and any of the panel members, if they would want to come in. Just to add one point, this technique uh, can also be used for uh, relocation of uh, subluxated IOLs, where we can fix one hat trick. We can also use this technique for uh, Sioni ring fixation or iris coloboma repair, or even for uh, spiral fixation of uh, spiral fixated IOLs. So we have used for other methods also, just to mention, 
and uh, if anybody is interested they can refer in the ijo 2018 it is published with full video yeah it's a very excellent video um, of iris fixation in uh, sewing technique just a moment uh, uh, dr ravi kumar you can stop sharing the screen so that we can i did i didn't share my i didn't share oh. i am i am sharing it now one second yeah. Yeah, can I, uh, Shika? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a very excellent uh, video, Dr. Ravi Kumar, uh, of the technique in which you beautifully uh, suture the irido yeah, Please continue, Doctor. Yeah, and uh, very boldly anchoring the lens to the iris itself, which you have just managed to suture. So that's why it has won the prize. I Thank you so much. Actually, I didn't have the option because I didn't have the expertise of uh, glued SFI oil. So I did what Dr. Aik Ahmed was telling, what goes best in your hand, that's what I tried. Yeah, I agree. I wouldn't have uh, dared to do that. I would go for a scleral fixated eye oil with which I am very confident. So that is really a nice thing to do. Do the thing it's which fine. you are best at. PB sir wants to- Can I add a few things here? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, a couple of things I wanted to add here is uh, actually, uh, we did not use a uh, sewing machine, modified sewing machine technique. Typically, this technique, what you use each single suture, typically cobblers use that suture. Okay, the way they put this suture. Mm -hmm. And we use that as a cobbler technique almost almost 25 years back. We published in uh, Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery that time. Exactly same technique. But what happened, the difference is the needle, 30 gauge needle, what we used to get. Those days, we used to get a one and a half inch needle. They stop now. This needle is almost three fourth inch, or just maximum one inch. And now it's a difficulty because going from the full length of cornea by diameter, if you look at it, it's difficult for this needle to reach from one end to other. And exactly what you used to do uh, when early days when we used to have including uh, pupillary dilatation, we used to take fixes and suture when we did not have iris soaks. The similar way what uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar has presented, fixing iris suture, fixing. Uh, iridis, uh, iridodialysis. But the problem is now you won't get that long needle, not available anymore. So now we switch to another techniques because sir, you, uh, you cannot go exactly across the cornea. You have to go a little bit oblique now to minimize that, reduce that length. We still can do, but sometime at certain angle, it becomes very awkward. Sir, uh, initially I tried this technique with the one and a half, one and a half inch uh, 26 needle. No, no, 26, yeah. It leaks, sir. 26 gauge you can't do because sometimes it makes a hole in the iris and disintegrates. When I tried this technique initially, I did that. But later on, now I switched it to dental needle. This is the dental needle, which okay. the dentist used for uh, periodontal anesthetic injection. So this has a uh, opening on both sides of the hub. So yes, you can see yes. either, either side and then uh, the hub will be useful for uh, handling very easily. Absolutely. And it is long enough. Mm -hmm. It comes in 27 gauge and 30 gauge also, sir. 30 gauge is ideal, actually. I mean, yeah. very nicely I showed, actually, your yeah. animation is very good. Yes, sir. And it has uh, the uh, advantage of this needle is, sir, it has a scalpel edge on both sides, not just on the tip. Correct. So it, it can pass through the iris without uh, much trauma and the sclera without much trauma and very easily. You need not put pressure. Yes. So... Thank you for yeah, that. I, I would just say congratulations, uh, Ravi. Nice, nice, very nice innovation uh, thank and you. presentation. Thank so thank you, including the music as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, the only thing I would say, maybe, maybe you know, sometime I also add a pupiloplasty suture sometime, just if the pupil, because interdialysis is difficult because you know the iris gets drawn to the angle, and sometimes the um, the uh, the iris is too far drawn over. So sometimes I just tie the suture a bit looser, the iris may not be completely in the angle, but it's good enough. And there may be a little bit of a hang back. And then sometimes I, sometime I add a bit of a suture, the pupil, just to bring it together. But uh, I think very clever. So congratulations. I love the, the thinking you have and the prize you have. Actually, you get a free trip to the inauguration of the new U.S. president at the Capitol. Congratulations. <laughs> the idea is innovative. It's different. And, uh, can I ask one question? Yes, sir. The, the only thing I want to ask Dr. Ravikumar is, is his wife a dentist? 
Oh no, <laughs> actually, I, his best friend I, is I, a dentist. I searched for this needle uh, on the internet uh, because initially I tried with a 26 gauge uh, one and a half inch needle, which the ENT surgeons use. And later on, uh, I was searching on the internet, and I, I actually I got this needle from UK sir through uh, courier from one of my friends. But later on, I found out that this is available in Delhi uh, from Ames uh, Dental Hospital. Very nice, very nice. Thank you so much. With such yeah. a large area of iridodynesis, oh, with such a large area of iridodynesis, the scleral fixation would have been anyway difficult. So I think it is a good thing that you went to have this for fixation. Thank you. I think uh, available on the subject of. Uh, Iridodialysis. When you have cyclodialysis along with dislocated lenses, it is scleral fixed eyeballs are excellent. Of suture, scleral fixed eyeballs are are good techniques because it sutures the eyeball as well as the ciliary body to the sclera. Thank you, sir. And uh, now we the other. Uh, people out of the 30 other videos we have selected the top 10 and uh, we congratulate all these people and their videos are available on the website and can be seen by the audience uh, by going to www.cataractcatalyst.in so uh, with that uh, i would ask dr shika to uh, ask any other questions or discussions which are there on the youtube or the facebook chat and uh, give a vote of thanks yeah uh, uh just uh, i would like to have the comments from the uh, judges of the video session regarding any uh, uh, any uh, different uh, observation as uh, dr pb was telling initially there was a submission uh, related to uh, the previous uh, carvale uh, lens uh, similar submission was there i would like to have the comments of the judges regarding the uh, top 10 Top well selected videos. Dr. Chetan, you are there. Dr. Chetan, Dr. D A D, Dr. N V N. Uh, yeah, Shika, the flange I O L was uh, there in the selected videos. That seemed to be a very good uh, technique, simple and uh, easy to fixate. But uh, that being a uh, hydrophilic is the only hitch. on a long term we'll have to find out uh, how it's going to work the videos were quite interesting and uh, some innovative techniques have been used so i would urge the audience to go on the website and have a look at the videos uh, the, they are uh, really very nice uh, some of the, they are really good quality and well explained uh, good, very nice videos it was a pleasure actually uh, viewing the videos and reading them so same here uh, had a good time watching those videos uh, got lots of ideas myself i mean it's always a learning experience when you see uh, videos prepared by others uh, and the way the people uh, innovate with regards to uh, techniques of suturing uh, putting an eye hole in this, uh, situations where uh, an ordinary i mean even a uh, routine uh, uh, on a routine day would not even think about that out of the out of the box uh, planning is is really good i mean surgeons we know they uh, think on their feet and uh, they do really a uh, great job so it was a learning experience and i enjoyed and as i uh, as dr dhanashri says uh, i i suggest uh, i mean i uh, ask people to go and look at those videos and uh, learn a few tricks themselves thank you i thank everybody i thank the complete faculty for taking their valuable time out i know each one of you is uh, uh, very very uh, busy uh, surgeon and uh, in different really types of to you. yes really really thankful to each one of you and uh, really uh, learned a lot and enjoyed a lot there were a little technical hitches i uh, i guess uh, one of the links was not working but i'll make sure that it reaches all the audience the delegates uh, we'll make sure that uh, these fruitful discussions reach the people so many questions have been answered with really um, uh, a lot of the different points perspectives have come out of it and saw because of uh, the time taken out uh, by all of you i'm really really thankful to all of you from the uh, bottom 
of my heart and uh, to the audience also and uh, all those people who have uh, you know uh, all these 33 submissions came uh, within 10 days we we didn't give them much time but they were really enthusiastic and we had um, they they were also taken their time out they have uh, uh, sent us the questions and videos and really thankful to everybody and with that i think we will close for tonight thank you very much shika very well done and well done congratulations thank you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you so thank much you. for having all of us here thank you I would like to thank Good Dr. Vishaka from everybody's behalf for being so enthusiastic about thinking up of different topics for every cataract update, and looking forward to the next. What you know? Uh, once this thank COVID Shikha gets over, energy. the vaccine is around. We will have uh, uh, a real meeting, and we will have uh, everybody uh, here in Chennai, and we will have. the uh, not a webinar and a true meeting looking forward to that thank you bye, bye. okay so, thanks everyone good night everybody good night good night and i good want night. to thank uh, our multimedia team mr mohan he is he's been uh, he's done a great job and thank you thank you thank you And to all the people who have been working behind the scenes, thank you. Yes. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thank you, Sri Valli. Bye. 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 Congratulations once again, Dr. Ravi Kumar. Great inputs. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether you are the same Ravi Kumar or not when I saw the name. <laughs>